individual development, and it means constant confrontation with things you don't understand and constant attempts to ensure that your character is composed of truth and solidity rather than deceit and to make of yourself something that's built on a rock and not predicated on sand. And the thing is, it's, it's one thing to tell people that because maybe they should take care of themselves. But I don't know if that's enough to tell people because they don't take care of themselves that well. But it's a completely other thing to say, look, you know, every time you make a pathological moral decision, you move the, one, the world one step closer to complete annihilation. And I absolutely believe that. I think the historical evidence is crystal clear. And I also think that every time you make an appropriate moral decision and you manifest moral courage in the face of your own vulnerability, then you move the world one step farther from the brink. And every, that's the case for every single person. You know, Solzhenitsyn said, drawing on his Eastern Orthodox Christian background, every single person is the center of the world, a center of the world, not the center of the world. The world's a complicated place. It can have all sorts of centers. It's hard to believe that you might be one of them, but everything about human existence is hard to believe. The fact that it's here at all is hard to believe. The nature of it's hard to believe. Everything that human beings does is so ridiculous and remarkable that it's like it's a consistently and constantly unfolding miracle. The idea that each of you might be a center of the cosmos in that infinite admixture of ridiculousness and absurdity is, is hardly more than one more ridiculous thing to swallow. Well, I'll summarize, I guess. It said that tragedy is a precondition for being. Being is the interplay between the finite and the infinite, and in that interplay there's tragedy, there's no way. All right, what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Ceremonial witch, ceremonial witchcraft. You know what we do? I got the bandana on, because there's only one place I fucking go into, and it's because I have to. If I don't go in there, then I could start using drugs again, which I don't think would happen, but... So the one place I go to is my clinic, and I put on a bandana. It's been consecrated to protect me. It's also my wife's grandfather, whom she loved. Um, it's his old one. He bought when he wanted to start hunting when he got a terminal illness. So, man, this thing's got protection all over it, but there's no way it would ever hurt me. Kind of like, you know, the stories you hear about people wearing a mask while they're fucking driving. And a little bit of carbon monoxide, because don't get it twisted. Carbon monoxide enters your car. Windows up, windows down, doesn't matter. This bitch. Like, we we make carbon dioxide. And you're at great risk wearing a mask and upping your levels of carbon dioxide in your blood. That's, that's fact. But this car, instead of our body produces carbon dioxide, all well, this car produces carbon monoxide. Instead of CO2, it's CO, which is the bad one, which will put you to sleep forever. And then you get to go meet whatever, whoever our maker is. So, not a bad way to go. But, this car, whether the window's down or up, it's going to be making that. It's going to be coming in if you have a mask on. You're breathing it in, you're breathing it out, you're breathing it in, you're breathing it out. Well, I'm sure when you breathe it out, it breaks down to something else. But, nonetheless, you don't want your airflow and carbon monoxide on your mask and that's all you breathe in anyways not why i'm making this episode so i was planning on an episode um not the one about hinduism although that's still in the idea phase and me writing shit down and i probably have enough to make an episode right now but i'm not going to man this thing is broke my knot just came undone that's fucked up see it's uh, things like that happen you gotta be like huh I'm under attack because like how does it not come undone while well, I'm driving and I'm barely moving you know it's one thing for a knot to come undone when you're moving but because then the vibrations and all that and I mean right now I just gave it a simple tie like once over boom the first step of when you tie your shoes but the last time what you just saw broken because I'm just at the clinic I don't want to pull out anybody pull it off take it run with it because people that are on Open and stuff they don't have a mask well they might think this is cooler and they might grab it and wash it so you know you gotta watch i keep my chains tucked in i keep my rings off and shades off and because you know it's one thing to go in there and brag that you got money and you're doing good and i want to be an example for these people which might be your stupid reason to go do that but really you want to look better than these people well these are the kind of people that be like oh yeah you're gonna make me feel like shit about myself well, I'm going to snatch your shit and run, yo. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
So don't do that in front of people like that. That's just asking for trouble. Anyways, so here's another episode I wanted to make. It was about Jordan Peterson. It was about the fact that I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson and I don't want to disrespect him whatsoever. But you can make the case that Jordan Peterson, his biblical series, you know, as much as he states it was the meaning for one thing, kind of like I just said, you know, I want to be an example for these people, so I'm going to wear my gold, I'm going to drive my fancy car in here, and I'm going to rub it in their face that this is uh, how good I'm doing over you guys, and that you guys can be this good too. You just got to apply yourself. Well, Jordan Peterson is decoding the Bible to teach us that, you know, we can use this Bible whether we're Christian or not, and it's got good messages in it. And whether you're atheist or Christian or anything else. Um, but my, I was going to say, but there's a hidden meaning there. And it could be a hidden meaning, rather. I don't know for sure. I think, I really do think Peterson has good intentions and even more now than ever. But, um, but um, you know, the hidden meaning could be just trying to get everybody back into a Christian mindset. Because if everybody believes in the Bible, then the under lining meaning of the bible and uh, the words that you read that have double meanings that you don't know what the other meaning of the words are well those will come to play in your mind and fuck with you and make you do things you don't want to do not only that but Yalbadov, if he is the actual entity who is the old um saturn from the bible or sorry the old god i don't sorry saturn the old uh, Old Testament God in the Bible is Yalbadov, and if you believe in any way, shape, or form of the Bible, then, you know, Yalbadov has possession of you, and he's going to keep you away from magic and anything else to open up your eyes. Well, then, if Peterson's getting people to look at the Bible, then, you know. So, there's going to be another one of those episodes, like, this is how you start a conspiracy, this is how you can twist someone who was doing good and double meaning it, but I never made it because I don't, I don't think it's right to do that. Just like the other day when I made the episode, I said I can kind of feel people's intentions. And this is why one of the first things I was going to do was make videos about all the people on YouTube that are fake gurus. But, you know, ultimately came to the decision that that's not serving anybody. That's not helping anybody. That's not doing any good for anybody anywhere in any way, shape, or form. Therefore, um, I never went through with it. Um, and so that episode of Jordan Peterson also wouldn't have helped anybody in any way, shape, fucking form. So I didn't make it. But nonetheless, um, you know, you can make that assumption if you want. But then today I was watching Peterson. Oh shit. I was watching Peterson. Um, an old Peterson, like on, on TVO. And the motherfucker's got like no gray hair in his hair. And he's talking about Cain and Abel stories again. And like this is the original content that he had. Obviously, the original content he has, he wrote down somewhere, and then from there has been tearing it apart, and then making it better and better and better and better and better. But this is the original statements and content that he had, referring to the Old Testament, um, saying, um, you know, he's watching this Jewish show one time, and there's a Jewish commentary about the Torah, and it's talking about how God is omnipresent. But when you think of Judaism being part of an Abrahamic religion and the heart of Christianity. Do you think of the God, or the Godhead, uh, whoever you want? I know when people say Godhead, it's because we're all in the mind of God, meaning the God's head is where we are. We're not in any other part of that God. We're in his fucking head. But anyways, God is omnipresent. Um, and omni in all those other ways. Omnipresent, omni, fucking whatever. Basically, he's here. You can smell him. You can taste him. You can touch him. You can feel him. He's everywhere. Now, Judaism isn't looked upon that way. Most people think God's up in the sky. But yet, when they were doing the Torah, um, their, the commentary was stating stuff like that. So why would that be? Well, it's because people assume too fucking much. People just listen to someone else's version of Judaism and decide, okay, well, Judaism is just like Christianity. It's like, no, it's far fucking from it. But anyways... They do, and they may all come from the same places, and there may be some sexes. Even I am at fault for this, because I've said there's some sex sectors, some parts, some maybe orthodox Judaism cults or wherever, but I, and I probably disrespected them for that, I'm sorry, but, you know, that solely believe, you know, Jesus never came. Oh, and Jesus comes to the end of the world. And they might still believe that, and, you know, I have proof of such religions, but 
you know, somewhere down the line, you can kind of look at that and say, okay, well, that's still secondary uh, from someone else's mouth, so it really isn't relevant. But anyway, it's not what I want to talk about. Um, but he started going on and on about the Cain and Abel story. And he starts talking about sacrifice and how, you know, people, uh, whenever he's teaching a class, and he was, he, this is like probably Harvard, okay, times, when Peterson was teaching at fucking Harvard. This Canadian from Alberta, whose parents and his friends worked in the fucking mines of Canada, digging for oil or whatever else we dig in our mines for. I mean, I, I've never done it, so I don't know. I am from Canada, though. Probably one of the reasons I really like that Peterson is one of these guys that goes around the world talking psychology, talking philosophy, talking, helping, teaching, self-improvement, self-help lessons. And he's some guy from Canada. You know, to me, that's beautiful. Now, once again, holy, oh, talk about beautiful fucking crowd of girls there. Shit. Um, but once again, um, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a philosopher, I'm none of those things, although I wish I was, um, and I think I might actively start working on becoming something of one of those as soon as I can, so that the day ever comes and other people do like what I have to say, and maybe I do need to be more well-versed in world psychologies and, and world philosophies and different religions and all that to be able to do this, but... Um, Nonetheless, the point uh, I'm trying to get at is I love the fact that, you know, there's this Canadian tour in the world telling his opinion and people are buying tickets to go see him and he's selling out fucking stadiums. That's awesome. Because I'm not a singer. I'm not an actor. Although I think I could probably do those two things. I would really need a lot of lessons on the singing and I would definitely need lessons on the acting, even though I think I'm a pretty good lawyer and it's why I've been able to be mischievous, deceiving. Um, I, I got a deceivingly smart tone to me, meaning in the beginning when doing drugs, not the end. At the end, you're very transparent, doesn't matter how good your lies are or how legitimate. And if you have fucking people helping you that they don't even know you're helping you, meaning like alibis that they don't really realize, um, people can just see through it because you're asking for money over and over and over again and your actions speak definitely louder than your fucking words at this point. But nonetheless... I've always had that ability, so I think I'm able to easily go into different characters and take on those characters, because even whenever I was dope sick, if I had to go somewhere, meet someone, you know, regardless of what it was, if I got into a character that, you know, I'm not a fucking junkie, I'm not a fucking whatever, I am this, this is what I am, I'm a fucking successful fucking drug dealing asshole who just fuck, or, you know, I'm a tough asshole who bit the crap out of people before, don't fuck with me, even though I'm going through dope pains, dope sick, I'm fucking going through withdrawal, I could push momentarily the withdrawal away, and be in that character, you know what I mean, and that's why I made whole episodes on pers personifications, the person, and how, if you decide that you're going to take on a persona, whether it's a beneficial one, or a shitty one, that you will get what that persona is allows you to get, especially if people believe that you are that person. Meaning, you take on the persona of a wealthy person. You start wearing a fucking suit around. Let's say you get a fucking thousand dollar suit and you find it at a fucking thrift shop for fucking 20 bucks, let's say. Even a $500 suit or a $100 suit. You wear that bitch around and you put on some gold or some really good um, jewelry that looks like fake, fake gold or whatever, but it looks really good like fucking movie jewelry or whatever the case is. And you get enough minds to think you make money. You go home and you put on that persona. And your family's not going to buy it. So you stay away from them when you wear that shit. And whenever you go around them, you keep that persona in your mind only. And not on the outside where they can see it. This way, you know. And you protect yourself against their thoughts and all this other crap. And that's a, that's a whole other episode on its own. But if you were to take on that persona, get enough minds to think you have money. I did this test with my wife before. And it worked. It worked beautifully. But, um... You know, you will, you will get money. You will be successful. You will get jobs. You will get, you will get people giving you money. The more money you pretend to have, the more money you fucking get. You want to, you want a, an easy trick. You want to become more successful. You want to get a job in Hollywood. Well, what do you think? People, so many people move to fucking Hollywood to work in Hollywood. The problem is not when the people drive to Hollywood and they don't make it. You know, you see a bunch of movies about that. Yeah, that's to deter you from doing it. 
because the biggest and easiest way, if you want to get a job at Hollywood, you need to move to fucking Hollywood. Don't expect someone to fucking recognize you in fucking Canada and then decide to give you a fucking script and just call you up or go on your YouTube site and see that, oh, okay, he did a bunch of good acting. No one's going to fucking look at YouTube for fucking someone for uh, to act in a fucking new movie they're making in Hollywood and decide just to plane you up here. You know how many other people that are closer to him that can act just as good and if not better than you? So you need to go up there and you need to do what you need to do to get into a fucking, in front of a fucking studio, in front of a fucking film director or whatever the case is. But anyways, I digress. The point of my episode I was going to make was to say that, you know, as much as I like Peterson, you can take his actions and decide from a pagan witchcraft point of view that he is trying to turn people against uh, against magic and for Christianity. Now, within what I was watching today, watching multiple videos of him, kind of like collages, just so I can get a bunch of different videos in. The reason I watch collages is not because they're fucking good or I like watching little bits and pieces. And so I can find interviews with different people that I've never seen yet. So I can find original stuff that I haven't watched before. So I see him with a different actress. Or I see them with a different uh, actress. was probably accurate. But I see him with a different host. So I look up that host. I look up the channel that's associated with the host. I look up the YouTube channel that's associated with it. And then I can find the interview. So that's what I was doing. And, you know, he was talking about how people use their words and their actions to shape their life and will become like creators. He was talking with that fucking, I forget the guy's name, but he's an openly Jewish, I don't even know what he is, but um, he's a good guy, fuck, and uh, he's got a lot of good opinions to say. He's obviously a little close-minded when it comes to his religion, but nonetheless, he's pretty open when it comes to other things, and I can't remember the fuck's name, so it really doesn't matter, but anyway, so all this is to say that there was a lot of things that just kept if they're emphasized in my mind to see so you're gonna make an episode saying he was against this yet here he is openly talking about like how magic can be real it's just not in that blunt way because Peterson knows better than to say or talk about um, any polarizing topics such as magic such as you know the guy's a fucking word wizard better than anybody I've ever seen better than any of the magicians I watch because when he's in front of a fucking camera he knows what not to say he knows what to say he knows how to answer questions without getting himself in trouble even when I've seen him angry he doesn't answer a fucking question in any polarizing way that could anger anybody watching it therefore everybody who's already angry with him watching him it's because they listened to someone else's point of view of him and decided to take it on as their own without actually giving him a benefit of the fucking doubt and that's my opinion I'm a little polarized when it comes to Pearson because I agree with Joe Rogan and many others that say uh, they've never seen anybody more targeted and hated against openly whenever his, and like people making up their minds about this guy, whenever his message is the total opposite, yet he is the target of this, this open hate against him. And it's just sad. It's just terrible. And that's not what he's trying to promote, but he is a counter a counterculture vi uh, voice that um, needs to be out there and obviously you're going to have enemies when you're, you're uh, going against culture you know, you're countering culture so so all that being said I'm going to probably play some of these uh, clips for you so that you can see that he is not against magic so that you can see he's not against he's not going to be going openly against religion he is of the Christian faith, and he says that, and he's open about that, and so on and so forth. He also doesn't hide or shy away from, no shit, he doesn't open, he doesn't uh, shy away from, what the fuck was I going to say? Son of a bitch, I'm going to say, oh yeah, um, about like what the church has done, um, all the pedophilia and child molestations and other things that have been done um, in the past. When it comes to uh, priests and children and all these sexual fucking bullshits that are happening. Um, and I don't mean bullshit in the fact that they haven't happened. I know they've happened. Um, my little town, Cornwall, Ontario, is bad for accepting fucking ex-offenders, ex-molesters and shit like that. They don't go to high-profile towns. They go to low-profile towns. And little towns like mine, 
where they can get a decent meal and they can get a decent job and not too many people ask too many questions, well, this is where they go. And it's sad, but true. So Project Truth happened. A lot of the people that were involved in that. Um, now, obviously there was a lot of cops. There was a lot of judges. There was a lot of lawyers. There was a lot of counselors. There was every type of fucking... Oh, man. There was, like... Except for maybe, like, tradesmen. And, like... Anything dealing with children... In some way, shape, or form. Like, you'd say, well, how does the judge deal with children? Well, there's fucking youth court day... Where kids don't want to get in trouble... And they'll do anything. Yeah. Sad. The parents... What the fuck the parents think they're doing there with the judge for that fucking long. But anyways. I can't talk about this shit because it makes me too angry and too wild, though. But... When that shit came out, it was came to light that wow, Cornwall has a lot of second um, reformed, or you know, they've already went to jail for a charge for sexual sexually abusing somebody in a different town. And they come to our town, and Project Truth comes out, and I guess what they've been fucking doing the same shit over and over again. So that's why I, I, I don't. I, I'm not saying bullshit as in it didn't happen, but the Catholic Church and coaches. Uh, various sports, you know, that's volunteer, right? Well, how do these guys get a job? Well, they volunteer to do free fucking community service for a while, which turns out it's not just free community service. They're doing it because it's court demanded. But they just tell people that. And people don't do their research. They just openly, yeah, okay, must be. And now, that being said, there have been some that have actually performed and, you know, changed their life around. Kudos to them. I'm not saying once a child molester, always a child molester. But, the ones that have changed are actively going to meetings and talking with people and still doing the therapy. It's kind of like me. I'm once a boxer. And people say, well, you can't ever quit fucking opiates. And some people say, well, you want to boxer at the dome? Well, that doesn't help you quit. If you want to quit, you got to be cold turkey and just quit. Well, the success rate on that is way lower than the success rate on Suboxone. So for now, I'll keep going with my Suboxone until I can figure this shit out. So... The person who was actively talking about their mistakes and reliving the pain over and over again so they never do it again is has a higher success rate than the person who stopped, stayed stopped for a while, and then as soon as the opportunity presents itself where they might be able to get away with it, they take it again. Versus the guy who's trying, doesn't put himself in positions where he's going to be around children, and who actively keeps knowing he made a mistake and that mistake caused so much harm to not only the victims but the victim's family and to his family that he doesn't do it again but in the people that kind of go back to society and hide and pretend it never happened will just end up perpetuating it and this, this comes back to the whole if you don't banish something and then invoke something in its place well nature goes to fill the thing that you banished with the same thing you banished meaning you get rid of that part of your life but you don't invoke something else new in there well then you're never going to get rid of it but and that's where these guys, you know, they never forget what they did. And they've replaced going around being... Because it's not just the act of the sexual assault that they did on the children or whoever. It's the lying, the planning, everything else that come in effect. They, people that have a devious little mind, like mine, fall in love with their own, their own planning. The fact that they can be so devious and get people to believe it. They want people to almost catch them so they can see their brilliant fucking plan. Because they can't openly tell you what their brilliant plan was. And they can't they can't tell anybody else. They can't show off their skill, basically. But they have a skill. So it's all that that needs to be replaced. So the guy going to someone to talk about at least gets to say, hey, I'm brilliant in this way. Do you know of any way this might be helpful to anybody? And then maybe they could find a new fucking hobby. But the guy who pretends nothing happens is still bound to his own ways. Whether at first it's just hiding his past and no one finds out about it. And then eventually, well, fuck it, it does. So, well, maybe I can actually do this with a kid who doesn't really get hurt, who really enjoys it. You know, it's what they say in their fucking mind, which is sick. And then, you know, and then they start fucking doing this this heinous, disgusting act again. And then they get shot in my fucking hometown. And hometowns like it. And then we are, you know, they have to go somewhere because Canada, you can't kill people. Not, um, not by the fucking system anyways. 
Whereas in the states, certain fucking, certain fucking states, you can just get caught stealing three times in a row, and we, all right, no more tax money spent on you. You're done. Which, you know, they have a point. And I, I, I take up being an ex-criminal who's changed his life. I take the point of view of anything can happen. Anything can change. And if you're going to stay pe- stuck in your system after you've got caught. Because once you get caught and you get shot out. And you can say, well, I'm a deep gang member and, uh, you know, I'm not able to change. Well, bullshit. You can get out of there. I'm not telling you to rat on your boys, your family, or anything like that, and get them to fucking move you out. But once you get out, you can get them to pay for a fucking bus to a whole new fucking city, and just start over and send them something saying, "Guys, I really, I didn't rat anybody out, so I hope you meet this with respect." But I had to leave that lifestyle. I wanted to go in any other town and just start fucking fresh and change my life around and just see if I can do whatever. So. I got the pigs to give me a bus ticket to another city. I'm not going to tell you where I'm going, but I'm not going to be in this town anymore. And the reason why people don't leave is, oh, my family, this and that. Well, if your family is going to enable you to do heinous acts, then they're really not fucking family, are they? Because if you know when you get out of jail, you're going back to a life of crime, well, then you shouldn't be doing it. And here's the thing. If you don't think what you're doing is a crime, then there's no reason to worry about it because then your subconscious won't allow you to get caught because you think it's real and then there's nothing to fucking worry about and I truly believe that and I truly believe there are certain crime lives out there that you can sustain you can sustain um, selling marijuana you can sustain selling cigarettes you can sustain um, some laundry doing some illegal money switch over laundry for certain people there are these petty little things where you're helping criminals and, and you are becoming a criminal in the process, but you can sustain as long as you're smart and you don't get greedy. You can sustain these things. There are some you can sustain. And in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with doing that. If the police are allowed to do a certain amount of criminal activity to catch criminals, well then you should be allowed to do a certain amount of criminal activity to help your fucking family, help your kids go to college, help yourself live a better life. It's the problem whenever you decide, well, Neighbor's got a bigger boat than me, so I need a bigger boat. So I'm going to do the money laundering plus the cigarettes plus the, the marijuana. And then you get so much money that you have to start doing bigger. And then the hell's AJ come by and say, whoa, you're cutting our turf. So now you got to start fucking moving for us or pay taxes. All the money you make, we need to fucking see the proof of it. And 10% to 20% to fucking 50%, depending on the guy and how much of a dick he wants to be. He comes up to you and says, I need all that percentage. And then you can keep doing your thing. So now you gotta hustle even more or you gotta hide it from them or whatever the case is. That's when the problem comes. And then people say, well, fuck it. I'm this deep. I might as well do it now. And they get in love with the evil personification that comes with it. Because trust me, I've been there, baby. And then you think you're this bad guy and you think that everything is fucking okay. And then you get caught. And if you're not a fucking true fucking person, you start ratting on all the people. And hopefully if you do that, you get your fucking head kicked in because you're nothing but a rat piece of shit. You do the crime, do the fucking time, and don't rat out your fucking boys, your family, or whoever you were involved with. Even if they were our assholes and you can justify it, it's still not right. Now, if you're being victimized by somebody and you want to tell on them, that's different. I don't want people or kids or anybody to hear my words and say, well... This guy's been punching me and picking on me at school. But if I go tell him I'm a rat, it's like, no, that's not a rat. Rat is someone who gets in trouble by their own hand. They are in criminal activity or they were the one doing the hitting. And they blame their situation on someone else. Negating all the blame off of them. Not taking any responsibility for what they did. So, for example, if my son Owen punches a kid in the head at recess. And this kid at lunchtime kicks the crap out of him. And then no one saw Owen punch him in the head. So Owen takes it upon himself to tell on him and get him in trouble only. And doesn't fess up that he initially started it. Well, then that's kind of being a little fucking rat goof because he started the whole fucking thing. And I made that very clear to my kids. If you start something with somebody and they finish it and you're just butt hurt and you're going to tell on them. No, that's a rat. But if this person's picking on you for no reason and you're trying everything to stay away from them, not get in trouble. And then you uh, don't want to tell him because you know you don't want him and other people to think you're a rat well no that's not a rat but anyways 
enough about all that. So she says that many good things and the tragedy versus evil um, TVO special. I don't know where he is, but it looks like a hall or reception hall or something like that. And, and he talks about how people are the creators of evil and you can't blame tragedy on the God or the malevolence or sorry the God malevolence. the God or the omnipresent um the omni the, I can't fucking remember how he said that but basically tragedy is a part of life it's what's programmed into the the the, the wolf to kill the rabbit it's what's programmed into weather patterns to happen to destroy houses and, and shit like that. And, you know, it could be upon the people. Like, okay, well, we keep having fucking um, tornadoes and and uh, hurricanes in this city. Or we keep having floods in this city. Or nearby here is always the worst and it barely reaches the outskirts. Well, then how about we just fucking stop putting houses here and declare that, you know, the devastation that happens every five years is not worth living here for fucking... 10 years and then all of a sudden devastation and another five years to repair by the time we got everything back to normal we get another fucking uh, hurricane maybe these places are just inhabitable and we can use them for something else like figuring out how these things happen and building big fucking walls to protect the land nearby from these devastations and maybe if we do that and people aren't living in these areas well then maybe we'll notice that the hurricanes start happening other places and if we look deeper into these people, maybe these people deserve to be fucking killed. <laughs> That's pretty mean, but you know, it is what it is. But these things are tragedies. And tragedy is part of life. Malevolence, evil, is something we start, we create. You know, and even in that interview, he actually talks about the Bulag Archipelago. Not very much. I think he was testing the waters to see if anybody understood or knew. And then he got a negative response, meaning when he said the Gulag Archipelago and upwards of 6 million or 60 million people may have died there at the hands of uh, Stalin or whoever he says, um, he gets a no response. And then he goes back to Auschwitz in Germany. But, you know, I got to give it to the man. It's, it's amazing the balls he has. You know, and I know he's not around right now and he's going through his own hard time. And I made a couple episodes saying things like, we need you right now. And it's a hard time. But, you know, everything from... I started off, the first thing I watched today was about the media and how he started saying stuff like YouTube is going to kill TV because TV is trying to force something on us and then YouTube is, we have to freely go look for it and this is why I make stuff. It's for people out there who freely want to learn about magic or my point of view or my philosophies. Maybe it helps them understand stuff, who knows. But people are actively going there to learn this and there's more and more demand for these intellectual conversations about real matters that are happening in the world today and people like peterson and shapiro and countless others that i can't name and i don't want to offend anybody if i don't name their favorite or the people actually saying these things but um there's more and more <sighs> sorry there's more and more of a need for this shit people talking about real stuff and that's what people want to see some people get lost in the fake bullshit. So there needs to be more real gurus out there like Peterson and the people he talks to or even debates against for that matter to go on here and start making episodes so people stop going to the phony bullshit crap, learning from fake fucking gurus and thinking aliens are coming and the government's capable of everything and they're watching us all and we're all going to be fried and zapped and 5G this and coronavirus that. And like, holy fuck, man. We need real people out there talking about real stuff so people stop going to these fake fucks, getting their stupid information from it. It's all fucking inaccurate, and they're just rotting out their fucking brain faster than candy rots out fucking teeth, which isn't the case either. But anyways, um, the point of all this is it could be connected to coronavirus. Um, and I'll go into this on a separate episode because I don't want this tribute to... Peace, Peterson, um, to go in a weird direction. But when I was listening to those things they were talking about initially, how he's counterculture, how Peterson is counterculture, he's countering a culture right now, 
in our culture was forcing views onto us, forcing opinions onto us to take. That's what the old TV, 2020, all the old sitcoms, they're all forcing this narrative onto us. And now with YouTube, we get to choose what narrative we want. But we can only choose if there's a big enough variety out there for us to choose from. And we need more people to get out here and talk about their fucking truth. If there's anything you ever take from my channel, it's two things. One, you're powerful beyond belief. You can start harnessing that power through magic. And two, if and when you do, and even if you don't want to start magic, you just want people to know where you come from. Maybe you hate magic and you want to let people know. Maybe there's something else that's happened to you. Maybe, 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 maybe. It's endless how far, how many options you got. But get out here and talk about something that's real to you. Something that you think people need to know. We need more real info out here. Otherwise, we're going to have fake guru after fake guru after infiltrated fucking Christian guru after infiltrated fucking um, old media people coming on here and trying to twist the truth into stupidity so you throw the baby out with the bathwater so that the real truth is negated, lost, gone, never to be found again because you're going to associate it with the stupidity of the aliens or the fucking reptilians or the fucking government Illuminati elites shit and then we never learn and that's why I was thankful for people like Peterson and everybody who's done something similar to him before and after and right now for what they do because we need more real sources of 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 truth and when it comes from a psychologist like Ralph Smart's one of the guys I really like watching and he's a psychologist and criminologist well then it is no wonder why I'm so drawn to him why I still watch his videos every day because Peterson has been off the map for how long now? And I used to watch, I watched every one of his fucking lectures on there. He's recorded himself in class teaching psychology. And I can rhyme those fuckers off to you like they're songs. I know them by heart. I know the lesson. I know everything about it. I miss his fucking content worse than anything ever. And it's inspired me so much. It's made me want to be a psychologist for God's sakes. You know? With him gone, it really sucks. You know, I got tears in my eyes thinking about it. I hope he's okay, but fuck, man, it makes me enraged. Because we need people like him to come out and say, this is not the way the world is. All you people believing in all this crazy shit, stop it. You're just escaping your life. You want the world to either end because you hate your life, or you want an excuse for why your life went to shit. It's all bullshit. Stop believing in Illuminati. Stop believing in fucking reptilians. Stop believing in elites. Stop believing in fucking aliens. And fix your fucking life. That's what these guys teach. And I can say that all I want. And they'll blow in the fucking face. But I'm not a psychologist. I'm not someone who's successful. I'm not someone who's done this shit yet. So no one's going to take my fucking word for it. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't take some random person's word for it. Well, maybe Frater Xavier I have. Because he's, you know, he's helped people, whatever. And Birch too, you know. But I'm a different person. I see someone talking online. And like I said, I can tell if they're being legit, being real, or being fucking fake. If they're being fucking fake, well, they don't last. And I don't fucking listen to them anymore. And that's why we need people like Peterson back. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for um, indulging me in my little pissed off rant there. This is stupid. The fucking meter on. Oh, I took this fucking shit off. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you for indulging me. But I, mean, I meant every word I fucking said. Um. If you are constantly waking up every day to fucking look at information about aliens and elitists and all this other fucking bullshit, dumb fucking retarded, um, how aliens are going to come back and any day now it's going to be the rapture and what you're seeing now is the rapture. It's bullshit. If COVID-19 is something that has been orchestrated, and I'm not saying it is because I'm not convinced completely that it's a fake fucking movement or anything like that. Although I do think it's been something that's been, um, it's something that's been, um, monopol not monopolized, what's the fucking word? Um, well, it's been exaggerated, and it's been used to sell masks and gloves to people at large, that's for sure. Especially by <gasps> now forcing us to wear fucking masks everywhere you fucking go. Um, that's used so businesses can reopen and pay more fucking taxes, so business don't stop closing because before they enforced the mass in every place you saw some really big lineups everywhere now there's still lineups places but 
they're not as large and they're gonna allow their, they can allow their capacity to be even larger because people are having face masks on now there's still companies that are enforcing both um, depending on the square footage of your of your company of where your physical store is you will be allowed to only allow 50 people in at a time or 100 people in at a time depending on how close all the places are within your store so that's something to keep in mind um, I forget why I was talking about that oh yeah no because they're enforced because they're masks so not only are they making people buy masks more often um, hence why I got a fucking bandana so I don't have to keep buying something new I don't give two fucks what people say about it. You want me to cover my mouth? Well, I'll cover my fucking mouth with something I fucking want to use, not something that you fucking engineered for me that I don't know what the fabrics are made out of and you don't put all the ingredients on the fucking list anyways, if, if any, which I'm pretty sure mine just come in a fucking baggie. So, um, and I don't want that shit seeping into my fucking pores and whatever it could be. But nonetheless, the point of my whole fucking little rant and everything that I was going off was Initially, it was to promote Peterson and his view and how we need more people like Peterson and his view. But now it's been switched from that importance to the importance of people coming out here and speaking their truth. And I'd rather see, I'd rather see successful gurus coming out here and speaking the truth. Obviously, it'd be great if every successful guru said, you know what, I had a vision. I kept seeing that vision in my mind playing out, and then boom, before you knew it, it fucking played out. But if we can't have that because people are too scared to come out and say their truth anymore, then let's have a bunch of Joe Blows from nowhere, like Corey LeBlanc from Cornwall, Ontario, Canada, and uh, Justine's of Savage from fucking buttfuck wherever in the United States, and someone else from fucking Elizabeth Eaton from London fucking saying whatever, and then somebody from Africa saying whatever, someone from China saying whatever, and all this shit. We can have all the regular people coming out here and saying the truth saying I don't believe in all the stupid bullshit and hype and you know people pr promoting fucking aliens coming back and the rapture happening is just some fucking horse shit and um to get you to be scared of fucking going outside of your house so you stay inside and just fucking absorb more of their fake content so they can get more hits so they can have more money so when they go outside they don't have to fucking need anybody and they can run the fucking world into the fucking ground while they enjoy the rest of their life because they can't create content that actually uplifts people so they use the opposite polarity to make people feel scared to get hits well yeah we need more people coming out here actively saying that that's some fucking horse shit and you shouldn't do that because there's a lot of people that are afraid out here now now there are some real reasons to be afraid tragedy happens to everybody it hits everybody okay there's no way around tragedy but evil and malevolence is something you can avoid and you can actively stop there's going to be a part i'm going to play soon by peterson where he says everybody is the center of the world a different center of the world and by choosing to tell the truth and do right then you can stop evil and when you choose the opposite polarity will you actually create it so um for one of the uh, there's many things that peterson says that I, I agree with and i promote and i've taken on some philosophies from him and tweaked it to to, for my own life and shit like that but one of the main things I really do enjoy and love that he promotes is you know because it's another way of saying if you want to change your world you got to change from within to change from without basically it's a correspondence it is a, it's it's stating the law of correspondence which as above so below as within so without as the soul so the spirit um, it's a way of stating that so meaning um, what he says exactly well, in a paraphrased exact kind of way, because I don't know word for word what he said, but you'll hear it shortly, um, is every person's a uh, center of the world, and the world's a complicated pace, so there can be many centers, and when someone realizes that they're a center of the world, it could be very um, intimidating and scary, but nonetheless still true, and what you do echoes and and multiplies within your reality meaning if you choose to lie to people if you choose to steal from people if you choose to do harm let's say you lie to your wife today and say you're going to go pay the electricity bill yet you stole that money you didn't pay the electricity bill and you're going to go buy dope well you just made your wife you just made your life and your wife because when she finds out she's going to be pissed and depending on how often you do this she might decide this is the last straw and she's leaving your ass but but that's on a personal level and that changes the world because then she's going to affect other people saying that she just left her husband that she loves that 
she can't trust anymore and so on and so forth but not only that is you just decided then and there to change your life for either the better or for the worse but every action that you take has um has a corresponding reaction so everything you do changes and it spreads out from you and what you decide if someone's on the fence about thinking if the world's a good place a safe place or a shitty place well then they find out that you just left your wife just left you and you're complaining about it and you don't give them the full truth well they might think the world's a shitty place and, you know once again it's a deception that you're promoting so you can see the new beaches so i am not trying to rush out of these topics it's just that um my wife's still running around and recording because i fucking hate going in places having to wear anything even if it is a consecrated fucking bandana it's still stupid to hide our fucking faces and have to fucking live like this. Like this is our arguably possibly the left or the right. I don't know which one you want to think it is, but one of those two sides have taken things way too far. Or too fucking it's this is too stupid. This is ridiculous. Use the guise of protection to fucking cover everybody's fucking face up. And like always always previously stated there's no system that's going to protect you completely there's no anything that's going to that is all good or all bad you know there's always a little bit of bad and good there's always a little bit of good and bad therefore wearing face masks may protect people from viruses but it also doesn't allow you to intake um germs so you can protect yourself against other germs it doesn't allow you to um breathe uh, the right amount of oxygen you're in, or it restricts your amount of oxygen you're taking in, which is gonna uh, restricting oxygen isn't gonna amp up your levels of CO2, carbon dioxide. But if you don't have enough oxygen coming in, the previous levels of CO2 that you have in your blood will be higher than the oxygen levels. So, yeah, but this will also make your CO2 levels higher. So you're getting less oxygen in to remove the CO2 out of your blood. Okay. So that makes your ox your CO two levels that might not have that might have been high, let's say before, but not dangerously high. Well, now that level didn't go up any, but because you don't have as much oxygen in you, the oxygen levels are lower. Well, that that now does make your CO two levels higher, but it also makes your CO two levels higher as well because you're breathing in more carbon dioxide than you are oxygen. Especially if you're a mouth breather who doesn't take a break in between breaths, who doesn't breathe in through the nose, who doesn't, you know, then yeah, you're going to just keep, <laughs> well, fuck, what do you think that does? <laughs> Stupid. But anyways, um, but yeah, all that's to say, um, all I was trying to get at is when you decide to lie, you decide to make the world a worse place. And when you decide to tell the truth, no matter how uncomfortable it is, no matter how shitty it is, no matter how bad it might make it, if you would say, you know what, babe, I took the last fucking of the of the electricity money instead of paying it, I went and bought dope. Well, as much as you shot her trust and ripped it up and pissed and stomped on it um, initially, um, because you decided to tell her instead of just get caught for it and then try to tell the truth once you got caught and try to say, well, please trust me, even though I'm trying to lie to you probably still right now, or I'm only telling you the truth because I got caught. Well, you decided to make a choice and say, you know what? I really want to change. I don't think this is good the way I'm living. I'm buying dope. I'm stealing money from my family to pay for my family's fucking whatever. So it's easier for a person to trust you when you decide to tell the truth versus when you decide to just wait to get caught. And that's what I'm trying to say. That makes it a better world. When most people are trying to tell the truth rather than trying to get away with lies, that makes everything better. That makes this place a better place to live. And then that means your politicians, they're people too at some level. On some level, Donald Trump is a family member of some little girl that goes to school with maybe even your little fucking girl at some level. Or he's an uncle or a grandpa to somebody that is related to somebody that goes to school with you. So your actions can definitely affect the fucking president. You can affect everybody. And you might not know why Donald Trump's in a bitchy mood today whenever he did his press conference. But it might be because somebody did somebody to something that somebody that something he knows. And because they were in a bitchy mood instead of being in a good mood like he saw in his head when he talked to them because they didn't like him, then, you know, he's going to treat the world the United States in a shittier way and enforce stupider laws because of how he was being treated. Therefore, 
this is not something trivial, not something you should just say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I decide to tell the truth, it's really going to help change the world. It absolutely fucking will. And I can give you way better examples than the one I just gave, but I'm going to close up this whole fucking talk so I can play the things I want to play very shortly, at least for you. And um, the podcast will be without the visual, but it'll be the longer version of this, of the Jordan Peterson stuff, of whatever and whatever else I decide to put on them. But to go back to the premise um, of what I was trying to state was when you decide to do good, then you're deciding and you're choosing that you want to live in a good world. When you decide to do bad and you choose bad, then you are choosing and deciding a bad world. Now, this doesn't mean working on your dark side. It's something you shouldn't do or anything like that. You should definitely work on your dark side. You should definitely picture yourself being a Nazi concentration camp worker. And you should definitely picture yourself doing atrocities to people, killing people, fucking torturing people. Because guess what? I don't know if you're a parent or not. I don't know if you uh, have a boyfriend or girlfriend. But on some level, at some point, you made your kid, you made your significant other, your partner, do something they didn't need to do just out of spite. And that's a small version of what a concentration camp worker did when they made someone walk a mile, two miles, 10 miles with a wet bag of salt on their shoulder all the way to the first spot and then all the way back. Because that bag of salt needed to stay where it was, but just out of fucking shit and giggles. Yeah, carry this down there and back. Like me, when I punished my son, my stepson, when I'd make him run the stairs 10 times, do a wall squat for two minutes, and then do some fucking push-ups or sit-ups after that. I got the okay from the child, so, uh, the, from the, her psychologist to do stuff like this when he does that because it, it not only does it um, take his energy level down a notch so he doesn't have the energy to do the things that are in his mind to act upon, right? Because someone who is very impulsive, well, if they have the energy to act on their impulsivities, um, then, you know, they're going to be a bad kid. But if someone who just has these bad thoughts and no energy to act on these bad thoughts, well, then you're just having bad thoughts. Um, so it doesn't actually affect the world. Because when he does something bad, then I choose to do that bad thing to him just to show him a lesson. And so that he doesn't do that punishment again. Well, it doesn't necessarily make it a bad choice. But still, it's making him do exercise he doesn't need to do. There's no point to it. It's like the person making that person carry that bag of salt across. It's like, oh, you decided to stand up. Uh, you didn't take as long standing up or you didn't uh, refer to me as sir. So I'm going to make you walk 10 miles this way with a bag of salt and walk the same 10 miles back with that bag of salt on your shoulder. And if you survive that and you don't decide to jump off a fucking bridge or, or commit some crime to get somebody to shoot you in the fucking head instead, well, then I'll keep fucking tormenting you since you can handle it. But this is what I mean. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but, but I was trying to prove the point that I've made my children do things that they didn't have to do, that was nece not necessary to do, and it was just out of spite. Now, I you use the guise of, well, I'm trying to teach them a lesson, and this goes back to what I said in my last video, that when you punch someone in the face, or last couple videos, when you punch someone in the face because they did something wrong, well, it might actually leave an imprint on them and set a trigger in them to not do that bad thing anymore. But it doesn't make the world a better fucking place, that's for sure. If I could teach my son a lesson without putting him through some physical pain and exertion and all this other crap, then... Um, I can make the world a better place and I can make his life better and I can teach him a lesson. But if I have to use it using these methods, so then it's not necessarily bring it to a better place. It's probably making it a worse place. So just because something gets a result doesn't necessarily mean it's good. But that's not really the point I'm trying to get at. So I'm just going to go off of that before someone else shows a date on me. And just so you know, I haven't done that method since he was really young, um, which doesn't make it any better. Being that he's what, 13 or 12 now? Fucking 12. Uh, 13, sorry. His brother turns 15 on the 13th. Uh, his brother, sorry, his brother turns 15 on the 13th of this month. Um, so that's like in two days, I want to say, or a day. But, so that means the two years apart. So yeah, he's 13. They're the same age. They're a year apart for most of the year. Or from March to July, they're the same age. So, or they're a year apart. Fuck, I can't talk today. So, meaning... Owen was 13 and Austin is 14 right now. But as soon as the 13th of July hits this year, then Austin will now be 15. He'll be two years older than him, which is still just a month and a bit older than him. But nonetheless, but the point of the whole shebang is to, to do good. Well, that we need Peterson back. We need people like Peterson to speak out. 
uh, people like you listening to me right now, if you don't have a page, if you're not talking out loud and telling people what you think they should do, it doesn't matter even if it's not right at first. It's going to help somebody on some level. Even if it makes them do something that's wrong, it's going to help somebody on some level and eventually they'll come to the realization that what they said wasn't completely accurate and then they'll switch it up like I do. I say some things and it turns out not to be true, but I never take it off. I never take the video off because it still was true at that time and it's still going to help me make its decision. It's still going to be a reminder when I try to go back to those kind of ideologies or ways of thinking or, you know, whatever. I'm going to be like, no, remember, that's wrong. And that's what it's a reminder of. So I never do that wrong again. But choose to make good decisions. Choose to make good decisions for you, for your family, for the world at large. And I think right now, we haven't been choosing to make good decisions. And that's why we're in this heap of fucking shit. That's why we're in so much trouble right now with masks, with COVID, with the state of the world. Because for too long, we've been choosing just to trust our leaders. And our leaders can no longer be trusted because they will, we, we've seen proof of this, they will allow us to believe something is truthful, something is real, that it isn't. Or it is a little real, but they are going to exploit it. That's what I was looking for. They're going to exploit it to the max and they're going to exaggerate it so that some companies can make a profit. And maybe our leaders don't want to do this, but because they're in contracts, like the doctors are in contracts to sell and only promote certain medications, well, maybe our political leaders have similar things. They're in contracts. And don't, before you say, well, no, that'd be illegal. Well, unless you know the letter of the law and you know exactly how it fucking works, don't be telling me what's legal and what's illegal. Unless you read the legalities and the way this shit works, don't be telling me what's real and what's not real. You're assuming that, well, that would be against human nature and that would be wrong, so they don't do it. But don't assume that. Because the written word and our written policies and our written charter of freedoms is a lot different than what you assume in your head. So go give that bitch a read and then come back and tell me I'm wrong. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed. Go ahead and keep this in and have a good fucking day. Before you can even address the problem. And I think what that means to some degree is you should not existence is justifiable and so tragedy itself which is merely a revelation of our vulnerability can't be regarded as evil it's just a it's a condition of existence and so it's necessary to distinguish the tragic conditions of existence from evil before you can even address the problem and i think what that means to some degree is you should not blame on the relationship between the finite and the infinite the terrible failings of humanity that can be laid directly at the feet of human beings. So earthquakes aren't evil, and cancer isn't evil, and mental illness isn't evil, and predators aren't evil. They're, they just are part of the way things are. But there are certain categories of human action that are definitely outside the parameters of mere tragedy, and those are the things we really have to get a handle on. Evil for me is differentiated from tragedy by its lack of necessity and its voluntarism. And it's a tenet, I think, of modern materialistic thought that there are social or material causes for actions. And it's an extraordinarily useful theory. And I think, but I think one of the unfortunate consequences of that is that we've tended to write off much of human misbehavior and attribute it to, say, insufficiencies in material conditions, which is, is not, an, it's not an acceptable theory. There are all sorts of human cultures that were characterized by virtually complete absence of material luxury well-being whose cultures were highly functional and, and highly moral. And to describe the propensity towards misbehavior as a consequence of economic inequality is entirely beside the point as far as I'm concerned. Evil is more pernicious than that which is generated for example, by social inequality. I think it's actually, although this is a terrifying thought in some ways, it's more appropriate to consider it a form of uh, demonically warped aesthetic. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean by that, for example, because the, exa because the manifestation of this warped aesthetic, aesthetic makes itself apparent under certain conditions. So, for example, I think it made itself apparent in the imagination of the first politician who, con who coined the acronym uh, MAD, or Mutual Assured Dis Destruction. That's an aesthetic of evil. To, to make a joke of a, 
a situation that catastrophic indicates the kind of malevolence that lurks behind the fact that such a condition exists. The motto on the gates of Auschwitz, I believe, in the Second World War, uh, work will make you free. That's another manifestation of the aesthetic of evil. It's a terrible, terrible, ironic joke. And it, it, it's instructive to meditate on what sort of imagination would have the arrogance to tell such a terrible joke. The concentration camps are classic examples of evil. And I think by an analyzing at least certain kinds of events that occurred within them, it's easier to get a clear idea of what evil constitutes. And one, one of the stories that's always haunted me, I guess, is I believe it's another story derived from Auschwitz. The prison guards in Auschwitz would take the prisoners who were already stripped of their dignity and to whatever degree possible their identity and their culture and their language and their status of, as valuable beings and yet that wasn't sufficient. They needed to be tortured in addition to that before they were killed and the torture often consisted of uh, self-evidently counterproductive work. Uh, uh, a situation that also frequently characterized activity in the Soviet Gulag Archipelago where Perhaps 60 million people met their death. A typical Auschwitz example was the requirement for prisoners to carry 100 pound sacks of wet salt from one side of the compound and then back again. Now that's evil as far as I'm concerned and, and you have to think about it from an aesthetic perspective in a sense because it's a celebration of horror and it, it, it's, a, it's a conscious attempt to violate the, the conditions that make life itself tolerable and it's aimed at dehumanization, destruction of the ideal, and at an even deeper level, revenge against the conditions of existence itself. I've tried to understand the developmental pathway that leads to acts like that. My academic research, as well as my clinical experience, has revealed to me that what appears to lie at the bottom of motivation for the excesses of behavior that characterize evil are two tightly causally related factors. One arrogance, another resentment. And both of those are tied up with vulnerability of human beings in the face of the infinite, but, but tied up with something more profound as well. The most thorough account of this that I've managed, I think, at least to partially comprehend, I believe is contained in the first couple of the stories in the Old Testament. In Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve and the fall of man, and the immediately following story of Cain and Abel. As far as we can tell, those are very, very old stories. They predate Judaism, at least in some of their in some of their structural elements. It's conceivable that some of the elements in those stories are as old as the human capacity to tell stories itself, assuming that they were grounded in an oral tradition that predated the written tradition. And we know that oral traditions can last, at least in some forms, unchanged for periods of up to 25,000 years. So the anthropological and archeological evidence is fairly clear on that point. These are very, very, very old stories. And people remembered them and created them for reasons we really don't understand. And they're, they're strange and mysterious and unforgettable all at the same time. The story of Adam and Eve, as far as I can tell, is the story of the coming of consciousness, the coming of self-consciousness to mankind. And I think that the human... The, the human, human self-consciousness is what separates us from animals. In Genesis, there's an insistence that when Adam ate the apple that Eve offered to him, the scales fell from his eyes, and the first thing that he realized was that he was naked. And what that seems to me to mean is that, I, mean, I think it means, first of all, that women make men self-conscious. And I think there's ample reason to presume that, and there's good evolutionary reasons for suggesting why that might be the case. Because sexual selection among human beings has been a primary force of evolutionary development and sexual selection in human beings is primarily conducted by women. So for example, as Roy has pointed out in his address to the APA a few years ago, and I hope I get this right, twice as many of your relatives were women as, as men. 
And that means that women are more frequently reproductively successful than men and that they reject most men. And the rejection of a man for reproductive purposes by a woman is the most serious form of rejection that's possible from an evolutionary point of view because the judgment is that, well, you might be nice enough to talk to, but you're sure not fit to have your genes propagate into the next generation. So it's no wonder that women can make, self co make men self-conscious. And I think there's some reason to presume that it's the sexual selection forces that women placed upon men that drove rapid human cortical evolution and the development of self-consciousness. Now, that's a leap, and there's no way I can justify that in the course of this particular uh, talk, but I think there is good reason to presume that it's the case. In Genesis, human beings become self-conscious, and the first thing that happens to them is that they realize you're sure not fit to have your genes propagate into the next generation. So it's no wonder that women can make, self co make men self-possible from an evolutionary point of view. because the judgment is that, well, you might be nice enough to talk. I can justify that in the course of this particular uh, talk, but I think there is good reason to presume that it's the case. In Genesis, human beings become self-conscious, and the first thing that happens to them is that they realize they're naked, and then the next thing that happens to them is they develop the moral sense to tell the difference between good and evil. And it's a very strange thing, because in some sense, before a creature is self-conscious, there is no distinction between good and evil, because as I said before, a predator is not evil, it's just a predator. The fact of a predator, like a wolf, might be a tragedy for the rabbit, but you can't be assuming that the wolf is evil merely because it wants to eat the rabbit. But with the dawning of self-consciousness, there, there seems to be the emergence of a moral sense that's essentially unique to human beings. And that has something to do with our capacity to reflect upon the mechanisms of our action and then for some reason to be able to modify those actions and to choose which ones to implement into the future in the future. We don't understand that. And you can even deny, if you'd like, that the, the phenomena of free choice exists, but our culture is essentially predicated on the notion that it does exist, and in the absence of evidence that it doesn't, I'm going to take the easy way out and assume that it does. Otherwise, otherwise things fall apart, and they fall apart badly. When, after Adam and Eve become self-conscious, the first thing they do is close themselves. And to me, that's a mythological description of the emergence of culture as an intercession between the, na the fundamental vulnerability and nakedness of the human form and the depredations of nature. If you realize that you're vulnerable and, and, and prone to death, the first thing you're going to do is to start rearranging the manner in which you construe yourself so that you can protect yourself from such an unfortunate outcome. That's, I think, partly why God curses Adam with the necessity of work once he finds out, once God finds out that people have become self-conscious. Like, if you know that, what's, that winter is lurking in the future, for example, you're going to work. And animals don't work. They're just motivated to do whatever they do. But humans work, and that means they subvert their day-to-day -day motivations, their immediate motivations for the purposes of future security. And there's a real cost to that. I mean, part of the cost is separation from the pure and unadulterated flow of animal life. And I believe that people suffer from that absence of flow continually. And, and, and the, the advantage they gain from it is that they can plan for the future, but the disadvantage is that they're calculating and cold and separated from their own instinctual resources. Eve, of course, is cursed by what's going to be terrible pain in childbirth. And that's related to the development of the immense skull size that characterizes human infants and their incredibly lengthy period of dependence, which is also associated with their immense brain. After Adam and Eve become self-conscious, they hide. And this is actually a comical part of Genesis. It's never really read as a comedy, but it is a comedy. Even the fall itself is a comedy. And 
So they're hiding away behind a bush. And God comes walking through the garden. And God, the infinite, is accustomed to walking with Adam with no interruption of the flow of information between them. But Adam isn't there. And God says, you know, where, where have you gone? And Adam says, well, I'm, I'm hiding. And God says, which is kind of stupid, really. And, and this is why it's a comment. It's like he's hiding behind a bush. And this is God. And he can see through bushes. And like Adam should know that. But it doesn't really matter. He's hiding behind this bush. Anyways, and, and God, so Adam says, I'm hiding. And, and God says, well, why are, well, you know, what, why are you hiding? Well, it's because Adam is ashamed. Eh? And Adam says, well, I'm naked. And this is an example of the tremendous compression of human wisdom into a few lines that characterizes mythology. You say, well, why would people hide from God once they realize they're naked? And I would say, well, that's pretty obvious. Like, once you know you're vulnerable. Or do you really have enough courage to manifest any sort of semblance of a divine destiny? Well, the answer to that is pretty much clearly no, and it's no bloody wonder. And so the hiding is that people hide when they're self-conscious and vulnerable. And what do they hide from? They, they hide from their deepest destiny, and it's no wonder. And God says, okay, yeah, well, you figured that out, how that happened. And Adam says, and this is comical too, well, it's the woman's fault, which I think is really funny, and which actually may have been the original sin and not the eating of the apple, right? The first time that the man blamed the woman for his self-conscious misery, I think that's the real fall and not the rise of self-consciousness itself. Anyways, we know the rest of the story. God says, oh, well, the cat's out of the bag now. You know, you know you're know, you vulnerable, and from here on in, history starts. You're out of paradise. You're out of unconscious identification with the natural world. You're going to work. You're going to sweat. Lots of the time it isn't going to work. And women, they're going to be beholden to their husbands, not because that's divine fiat, but because the developmental the developmental dependency of a human infant is so extreme that women are cursed to rely on men for protection when they're at their most vulnerable. Fine. So that's self-consciousness and an explanation for why people would hide away from their destiny. But then the next story, the Cain and Abel story, really elaborates that out and describes it. And so Cain and Abel, of course, are two sons of Adam and Eve, and they're really the first people because... Of course, Adam and Eve were made by God, so they're really not people at all because people are born, and Cain and Abel are the first two people. And they characterize, as far as I can tell, two canonical patterns of reaction to the terrible vulnerability that's revealed as a consequence of the development of self-consciousness. Cain and Abel make sacrifices to God. Why? Human cultures make sacrifices. That's what they do. Sacrifice, sacrificial ritual is a human universal. Blood sacrifice is a human universal. Human sacrifice, at least in some anthropological epochs, was regarded as a human universal. Why do people make sacrifices to God? To please him. It seems like a mystery to modern people. I ask my students, what sacrifices did you make to go to university? Well, they can answer that in two-tenths of a second. You know, they can't party as much as they might have. They, they can't drink nearly as much beer as they might have liked to. More seriously, a lot of them work. A lot of them have put their families in, in, in serious financial straits to send them to university. They've given up all sorts of things in order to pursue, pursue a course of action that they believe will best ensure their harmonious relationship with the nature of reality. Everyone makes sacrifices. Okay, we can say that now because we're psychologically sophisticated and linguistically sophisticated. We know something about human psychology. But thousands and thousands of years ago, before people had this explicit psychological acumen, the best they could do is act out and tell stories about human psychology because they hadn't developed any further than that. And Cain and Abel is one of those stories. The sacrifices are burnt on an altar. Why? Well, the smoke rises. Well, so what? Well, God's up in the sky, and if the smoke rises up there and he gets a whiff of it, he can tell what the quality of the sacrifice was. And you can laugh about that, and you can think, you can think about it as primitive, but it's not primitive. It's artistic, and it's beautiful, and it's, and it's accurate. And here's why. It's because before the invention of the electrical light, and maybe before the invention of fire, and the closest a human being could ever get to direct confrontation with the absolute unknown was to look up at the night sky. 
Because the night sky, especially when it's sprinkled with stars, confronts you directly with the fact of the infinite. And to make the presupposition that God resides in the infinite, and, and you're having a direct experience of the infinite at that moment, is not a primitive notion. It's a, it's a very intelligent and, and, and creative hypothesis. And so the notion that God occupies the sky, the day sky, being equally as impressive as the night sky, is not a primitive hypothesis. It's a reflection of the nature of a certain kind of human experience. You burn something and you send the smoke up. God gets a crack at determining the quality of your offering, the quality of your sacrifice. Well, let's, get, let's be perfectly clear about this. If your sacrifices aren't first rate, the nature of your relationship with the infinite is going to suffer dreadfully. And that's exactly what the story of Cain and Abel reveals. Now, Abel... He's a trusting character. He believes in the nature of experience and the nature of existence. When he's called on to make a sacrifice, he sacrifices the best that he has to offer. And that makes God happy. And as a consequence, everything that Abel touches turns to gold. Everyone likes him. They respect him. His crops multiply. He's successful with women. Plus, he's a wonderful guy. So you could hardly imagine a more annoying creature if you possibly attempted to do it. Whereas Cain, see, Cain has reacted to his self-consciousness by withdrawing from the infinite. And there's a tremendous danger in that because it starts to mean that he relies purely on his own devious devices to sail his ship through the shoals of life. He believes as his arrogance develops, as a consequence of his withdrawal from the infinite, a, a contact that he can't tolerate because he can't tolerate his own vulnerability, that he's able to deceive the structure of reality itself, to offer second-rate sacrifices to God himself, who can see absolutely everything, because the infinite is absolutely everything, and to prevail nonetheless. Well, needless to say, this does not work. And it, it doesn't work in an obvious way. If you talk to people and they reveal to you their unnecessary suffering, it's very straightforward to look behind what it is that they have to say. They'll tell you the poor decisions they made in their lives and the opportunities that they didn't take and the chances that they didn't they didn't have enough courage to grasp and the sacrifices they failed to make. There's nothing mysterious about it. And their own experiences teach them full well that they pathologize the relationship they have with the nature of reality. Well, that's a terrible thing. Well, and Cain is dreadfully unhappy. He's unhappy because nothing he ever wants happens, and that's partly because he doesn't really want it, because if he really wanted it, he'd make the right sacrifices. The salt is rubbed into his wounds by the existence of his brother, for whom everything seems simple, but of course really isn't. Cain goes to complain to God. And I had to read three or four different translations of these particular verses to figure out what this meant. And he says, what in the world is going on here? I'm working myself to the bone. I'm sacrificing things left, right, and center. Everything I touch turns to dirt. Everything turns against me. Like, what's up with the nature of reality? Cain's essential vulnerability is revealed and exacerbated by his pathological attitude towards his own actions. God says to him, essentially, sin is a predatory cat that crouches at your doorway and leaps on you at will. It, but if you only wanted to, you could master it. And that is absolutely the last thing that Cain wants to hear. Because if things are going from bad to worse for you, and you're playing a causal role in it, there's nothing more horrible than some, that, than, that someone can do to you, but reveal to you in a way that you can't deny that you're entirely complicit in your own demise. And that's exactly what God does to Cain. And so what does Cain do? Well, the logical thing would be listen, because if the structure of reality itself tells you something, it's best to listen, since there's no way out of it, but that's not what Cain does. He's so incensed by his essential vulnerability, compromised and exacerbated by his failure to make the appropriate sacrifices and to conduct himself appropriately, that he decides then and there, number one, to destroy his ideal, to reduce the tension that he feels when that ideal exists as a contrast point, and number two, to destroy the favored son of God. And so he goes out into the field and kills Abel. And God comes along and says, where's my favored son? And Cain says, I killed him. And it's so interesting to me that that story is placed, really, it's the third story in the Old Testament. It's, it's with the archaic stories. And it's a story that reveals, as far as I can tell, that there are two essential patterns of reaction to the self conscious, vulnerable conditions of existence. And one is humble, 
approach to in infinity with determined attempts to make the appropriate sacrifices. The other is arrogance, resentment, the keeping of everything good for oneself, and the degeneration of the soul into something that's homicidally murderous. Well, the story doesn't stop there, and it gets really compressed in this part, and that's perhaps because some of it's been lost with the passages of time. But the next thing that happens is that, well, God doesn't punish Cain. And you think, that's kind of strange. I mean, the Old Testament God, he's punishing people left, right, and center. It's right. Why not Cain? And you think, well, he marks Cain, and he says to the people who are around that they should leave him alone because he's been marked by God as to be left alone. And the reason for that, I think, and this is something that's reflected in our legal system, is that murder promotes revenge. And revenge destroys societies. And so God puts an end to the situation right there and then by telling people that despite the fact that Cain has, has committed a terrible crime, that there will be no retribution. Cain goes off and gets married. And he has a number of generations of offspring. If you insult a member of the first generation of Cain's offspring, he doesn't kill you, he kills seven of you. And if you insult a member of the second generation of Cain's offspring, he doesn't kill seven of you, he kills seven times seven of you. And then on down the, ra down the road of the offspring of Cain is Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain is the artificer of weapons of war. And this stunningly brilliant story says, in its incredibly compressed fashion, that the motivation that drives the commission of the worst human atrocities is an inevitable social consequence of the refusal of the self conscious individual to make the sacrifices appropriate to establishing a harmonious life and their consequent degeneration into a kind of murderous and resentment-filled rage, rage propagating endlessly through its variations in society until everything comes to an end. And the next story is the flood. And it's not surprising, because if things go from bad to worse long enough, everything falls. And it's a terrifying story, and I didn't understand that story. I didn't understand that story for years. It wasn't really until I read Alexander Solzhenitsyn that, that, that I developed, I think, the cognitive capacity to under, even understand what the story meant, because Solzhenitsyn said in his Nobel Prize accepting speech, a single person who stops lying can bring down a tyranny, which is a stunning thing to say, but I would also say something that's been amply demonstrated and I didn't understand that story. I didn't understand that story for years. It wasn't really until I read Alexander Solzhenitsyn that, that, that I developed, I think, the cognitive capacity to under, even understand what the story meant because Solzhenitsyn said in his Nobel Prize accepting speech, a single person who stops lying can bring down a tyranny, which is a stunning thing to say, but I would also say something that's been amply demonstrated in the 20th century because we have, we have historical examples of people who did precisely that. Gandhi did it. Vaclav Havel did it. Nelson Mandela did it. Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago was definitely one of the axe blows that brought down the Soviet Union. A stunning achievement for a person who started writing that book by memorizing it when he was a concentration camp victim this far away from starvation. It shows you, as, as clearly as anything possibly can, how powerful the human spirit can be if it's willing to take on the obligation of its relationship with the divine. And also, how terrible things can become if the responsibility of that burden is not shouldered. Now, it's no wonder, as far as I can tell, that people don't think this way, because thinking this way is it's catastrophic in a way, because the burden it places on the individual is so extreme that it's almost unbearable. Well, and, uh, but, but that's exactly why it is in, in Genesis to begin with that Adam hides when he becomes conscious of his own vulnerability. It's like he thinks, well, a creature such as I, I could never bear such a burden. Well, there's a lot more to people than meets the eye. And the only way I learned that was by looking at people's and my own people's and my own capacity for evil because I started to realize that we regard ourselves as narrow little beings in a particular kind of box. And there's real comfort in that, although there's tremendous limitation. You cannot see your way out of that box until you know well, what I teach my students. I teach them about Nazi Germany. And I try to make them understand that 
There's an overwhelming probability if they were in Nazi Germany in the 1930s that they would have been perpetrators and Nazis. An overwhelming probability. And if they can't accept that because it's a historical fact, they have absolutely no idea who they are. Now, imagining yourself as a Nazi perpetrator is an unbearably terrifying thing to do. But I don't believe that you can do, I don't think that you have any insight whatsoever into your capacity for good until you have some well-developed insight into your capacity for evil. Because people can tell you till they're blue in the face about your capacity for good. It just sounds like, uh, it sounds like wishful thinking. It sounds like the sort of thing that an advertiser might tell you on TV. It's just too good to be true. And I don't think people believe it. But I think that if you tell people that, you know, in the cold, dark corners of their mind, there are motivations that are so terrible that they would, they would traumatize themselves if they were ever revealed, that everyone knows at some level of analysis that that's absolutely true. You think there's evidence throughout history that it's possible for people to be enlightened. And you'd think, since enlightenment is viewed as the medication for vulnerability and death, that everybody would be struggling as hard as they possibly could to be enlightened if such a state exactly and precisely exists. But if the barrier to enlightenment is the development of self-consciousness of the individual human's capa infinite capacity for evil, then you can be immediately convinced about why enlightenment is in such short supply. When I finished my first provisional examination of the sorts of motivations that drove people to set up concentration camps and to torture people terribly in those camps, I came to a terrible conclusion. It was a conclusion that I think in some ways was the worst thing that had ever happened to me, maybe intellectually and morally. I, I thought... I came to understand why it is that people depended on their group identity and their cultural identification because that helped protect themselves from their own vulnerability. You have to believe things because you just don't know everything. So you have to believe things. They fill in the gaps. The beliefs fill in the gaps. If the beliefs are stripped from you, then your defenses against the infinite are stripped and it's no wonder that people will defend their beliefs. I thought, well, you do, if you're too involved in defending your beliefs, you're going to be willing to kill other people in their defense. And we're so technologically powerful now that we can no longer be willing to kill other people in the defense of our own beliefs because the time for that is past. And I realized, well, if you, if you don't stand up for your beliefs, you leave yourself bereft, you're open to the depredations of the infinite. That's equally intolerable. It seems to leave no way out. There is a way out, you know, and I think it's the way out that Genuinely religious people have tried to offer humanity for thousands and thousands of years. And the way out of the conundrum posed to you by your reliance on ideological beliefs and your vulnerability in the face of the unknown is the development of a truly integrated and powerful character. As you do and not that's understand. and constant attempts to ensure that your character is powerful. The conundrum posed powerful character. And that's a individual development and it means constant confrontation with things you don't understand and constant attempts to ensure that your character is composed of truth and solidity rather than deceit and to make of yourself something that's built on a rock and not predicated on sand and the thing is it's it's one thing to tell people that because maybe they should take care of themselves but I don't know if that's enough to tell people because they don't take care of themselves that well but it's a completely other thing to say look you know Every time you make a pathological moral decision, you move the, one, the world one step closer to complete annihilation. And I absolutely believe that. I think the historical evidence is crystal clear. And I also think that every time you make an appropriate moral decision and you manifest moral courage in the face of your own vulnerability, then you move the world one step farther from the brink. And every, that's the case for every single person. You know, Solzhenitsyn said, drawing on his Eastern Orthodox Christian background, Every single person is the center of the world, a center of the world, not the center of the world. The world's a complicated place. It can have all sorts of centers. It's hard to believe that you might be one of them, but everything about human existence is hard to believe. The fact that it's here at all is hard to believe. The nature of it's hard to believe. Everything that human beings does is so ridiculous and remarkable that it's like it's a consistently and constantly unfolding miracle. The idea that each of you might be a center of the cosmos, in that infinite admixture of ridiculousness and absurdity is, is hardly more than one more ridiculous thing to swallow.
Well, I'll summarize, I guess. I said that tragedy is a precondition for being. Being is the interplay between the finite and the infinite. And in that interplay, there's tragedy, and there's no way out of that. Evil is something different. Evil is the conscious attempt to make the conditions of existence more pathological than they have to be. And it's motivated by conscious intent. The motivations arise because people pay a terrible price for their self-conscious awareness. And that awareness is their awareness of their vulnerability. And that is a terrible thing to be aware of. That vulnerability can be confronted forthrightly, accepted, and the appropriate decisions made. Alternatively, people can retreat into their own rationalistic arrogance and attempt to deceive themselves and everyone else about the nature of their own existence and about the nature of reality. That pathway leads to nothing but destruction. I think that there's good reason to assume that it's too late in, the de in our developmental course as a species for that path to be acceptable anymore because we're too powerful. And if too many people stay on that path, we're going to do ourselves in. And so I would say, as we've become more technologically powerful, an increasing moral burden is being placed on each of us. It matters to the, to the, to the destiny of the cosmos whether or not you get your moral act straight. And I don't mean that in a trivial way. I believe that that's as close to an empirical fact as anything that can be demonstrated. And I also believe that's as terrifying a thing to consider as anything you could possibly imagine. And maybe it's too much to ask of people. But you know, our great religious traditions do continually remind us that inside every human being there's a spark of divinity. And that idea is a precondition for our entire system of law. There's always the possibility that it's true. And if it's true, it means that there is a, there's a, there's an infinite avenue of potential that lays open to every single person and that the ability to transform the terrible conditions of reality into something not only acceptable but worthy of celebration actually lies within our grasp. And the alternative, that, the alternative to that is the continual generation of a kind of hell that's so incomprehensibly awful that by any reasonable person's standards, it has to be regarded as something to avoid. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah, so um, whenever someone's doing it to you, it's probably their will um, punching you in the face but nonetheless it's causing you to have a negative emotion uh, with with the will and the thought that they're forcing into your head right so it's all the same and when you're doing magic what are you doing while well, you're in front of your altar you did all these rituals there all these exercises within your ritual and then you have a thought and you are willing this that you do well the ritual is like the will that you're using to do the ritual to bring it into being and then you're adding your love emotion or your fear emotion whatever you want into there and then it becomes so so all magic follows those laws so don't let them use those laws against you just for your benefit and i give a lot of information here probably a lot of things i left open now i don't always do that on purpose i try to look back on it and close them but as i told my wife prior to this i said sometimes you got to leave things open so for person listening to come up with their own conclusions so I'm not forcing anything down their throat so they do their own research so they come up and make up their own mind anyways hope you enjoyed I hope you have a great day so what's going on everybody I forgot to fucking put the ending part of my video on there on my video from yesterday and which people probably didn't watch it to the end anyways um but there's only like a minute and a little conclusion not much information so you've probably already seen it it's before this video if you're wondering why i'm wearing a bandana well i'm gonna talk about this bandana in a second but i want to be like a fucking uh, gangster a fucking thug a fucking bandit Bandits wear bandanas in, at least at my clinic, I've seen a sign saying, 
What can be used as a face mask? And it says medical face mask, non medical face mask, bandana, or scarf. So if I'm being forced to fucking wear something, I'm gonna at least wear my black and white bandana with more black than white on it. Meaning most people are more dark than light. It's even got some fucking dragon on it, blowing fucking shit and fire out smells and highly symbolic. And when I don't have to wear it, I'll put it on my fucking. Hanging out my left side, hanging out my back side, only on the left side. Yeah, that's the crip side. Ain't no other way to play the game the way you play. I cut so much, I'm a motherfucking DJ. Two, yip, a yip, a one, yip, three. C O R E Y L E B L A N C. <laughs> Instead of Snoop D O double G. But, anyways, that's Snoop Dogg from Drop It Like It's Hot. Probably, I don't want to say one of my favorites, but definitely a top five from Snoop. I like the OGs. When it comes to rap, I don't like a lot of rap, but I started listening to rap when I was a kid. Rap came out, sorry, rap didn't come out when I was a kid, although it did in the 80s is when NW, but I was born in 86, so that means in 86, you know, they were either just making it or just starting, I can't remember now, but um, I was heavily influenced by Pop Daddy, Biggie Smalls, Busta Rhymes, The Locks, Lil' Kim, all the New York bad boy rappers that were fighting against, or quote unquote fighting against Tupac, um, Dre, um, fucking that big fucker who was like their signing guy, I can't remember him. But anyways, the song Hit Him Up by Tupac probably was one of my favorite songs. Oh, I like changes and all that because it's got a nice meaning, but... When you want to go fucking fight somebody like I've been lately, fucking hit them up. It's a great song to put on. It really has that fucking thought form energy of let's go kick someone's ass um, included in it. I'm pissed. I woke up this morning and my, my Illuminati chain had broke, which luckily I'm really good at fixing chains. And I just got a brand new wood burner slash... Um, soldering iron with all these fucking tips on it to make uh, wood burning carving fucking from girl earrings to fucking if you got a wood altar you can carve slash burn into it and it's cool because if you like I've only tried it on um, unstained unverithaned verithaned is not the right word arsal arsal Anyways, you know, the when you paint fucking wood with that clear fucking paint, I can't think of a fucking name of anything lately. But, that shit, um, wood hasn't had that yet. Anyways, as soon as you touch the fucking wood burner to it, and you know, my iron, my soldering iron, my old one, that had broken as well, so I haven't updated you on that. Not like you guys fucking care, but, um, my wood, my other soldering iron had broken, so... And it was a DYI, a DYI one, one I made myself. It worked well, it worked well, but I never knew how hot it got. This one goes up to 950. Um, it's somewhere in the middle of high end and low end ones. Um, so, you know, it is what it is, but fuck, it works well. As soon as you touch it to the wood, it makes a dark stain. It almost looks like you're using black ink on the wood, and yet it's like burning it in there. The only way to get it off is you have to sand it and you have to sand it for a while. But you can sand it off, it's like an eraser. <laughs> when you're ready on wood, so it's fucking cool. So, as I'm putting my altar down into the basement again, which there's some things I didn't know that you should do if you're on a basement floor, on a concrete basement floor that's right against the ground that I didn't know that I hadn't been doing last time. Um, so, that's kind of cool to know why maybe my magic was working a lot better back then. Um, you know, not really working better, but anyways, I don't know why I'm talking about all that. So, yeah, I got a new fucking soldering iron slash wood burner, and I'm going to carve all these protection symbols and manifestation symbols and all the Solomon and the wedding and uh, fucking ceremony craft symbols that I use on a daily basis right into like my fucking altar well altars I got one that's going in the middle and then one in the east one in the north and I think that's all I'm gonna do I'm not gonna do the air one 
even though I already have one in the east, but anyways, I'm not going to get into all that, but, but, um, once I have the paint done on the walls, like I have, I'm making all the checkers, like I said, the floor, the ceiling, and all four walls are going to be black and white checkers, black and white, favorite colors, baby, that's why my bananas, black and white, this is actually, this was my wife's, believe it or not, so it's got a lot of her energy on it, and I haven't cleansed it yet, but, that's part of the reason I brought it out here for this episode. And this is just going to be a small little video. I'll try not to take too much of your time talking about mask and COVID and all that crap. But yesterday, in the description at least, I said I was going to try to find you guys a loophole to not wear a mask. Because I don't believe in wearing a mask because I don't. I think it's stupid. I said it to the girls today at my clinic. They were looking at me like, you're wearing a bandana? Really? And then I was waiting for it because... Their sign said a face mask is, and this is where I saw it, a medical, non-medical face mask, bandana, or scarf. So I was waiting to be like, if you tell me I can't wear it, read your own fucking sign, you dumb fucks. But they never went there. They were looking at me like I looked cool, stupid, or hot, and I couldn't tell which one. And there was two of them, so one might have thought one, one might have thought the other, and that's why I was getting mixed emotions. But anyway, so yeah, I woke up this morning and my Illuminati fucking necklace is broken, so I'll have to put my fucking thing to use. Ever find out, find that happens, you buy something, like a fucking tool that, because that's what, wow, wood burning slash soldering iron um, can be used to fix jewelry. In fact, it says right on the box. That's one of the reasons I bought it, because I have a lot of things on back order for people's jewelry that I've been fixing. Um, mainly my wife and my one son, he's got, they got a lot of items each they want me to fix. Well, it's more like detail, alter, and create, putting things together, especially with my son, but my wife too. But there's a few other family members that I have things that I have to fix for them. They said no rush, but they probably know just because of the type that doesn't fucking rush to do anything. So it's better that they say that, set the expectation, but so, yeah, and I'm not going to do mine first, I'm going to do all theirs first, I'll try to do it in the order of operation, and if one is more complicated or too complicated to do it the way they want it to be done, then I'm going to move to the next one and then ask them questions, but anyways, why am I talking about that? I want to talk about the face mask, I want to talk about what you can do about this, so, I had a video a while ago about consecrating items, and how when you consecrate items, it's not much different from the type of healing magic you do when you're influencing your cells in your body. Everything has a consciousness to it. Every atom is moving. Um, everything is moving. My car right now that I'm sitting on, my shirt that I'm wearing, um, this fucking cell phone, fucking iPhone, fucking charger, um, the car itself, the seats, the leather, this fucking button to put me in the four by four right there. All that shit. All that shit is fucking moving. Everything is constantly moving, vibrating. So, because they're constantly moving and vibrating, because we know that, because we're taught that in science class, that is the collective consciousness. That is in the collective. That is in our, all our minds. Therefore, it is understood, it is part of our knowledge that if something is moving, if everything is moving, then it means there's a consciousness to it otherwise it can't move if there's no consciousness if something is dead it's stagnated it does no longer move it's like even the human body whenever it's dead technically the matter part of that body is still kind of moving yet it's decomposing and the atoms are no longer creating life they're simply dying off and the ones that are um the ones that are needed to continue the function of the heart, the pumping of the blood to keep it going. Um, those are the first ones that have gone, have stopped working. So then all the outer ones are starting to starting to go as well. So you know it takes a while to decompose, and that's why we put it in the ground because the body will decompose on its own pretty fast. If you put it in water, or sorry, water, cold water, or ice, it'll slow down the process. Likewise, if you put it in the, on the earth. It'll speed up the process. All right, sorry about that. I had to, well, you, didn't, you can't know this. It's just automatically goes, but. Wife was looking for my daughter's tablet. 
Anyway, so everything has a consciousness to it. And it's not necessarily that everything, like the flower pots in front of me, the fucking windshield of the car has, to say the car as a whole has a consciousness. It does. It kind of does. Well, I mean, it's speculation, so, you know, I don't really know. Um, sorry, my wife keeps texting me. I just can't find the fucking tablet. I left it right near the fucking microwave yesterday charged, so... One of the kids in the living room must have took it. Anyways. Um, so yeah, the car as a whole has a collective, right? So all the fucking... All the atoms that make up side panels, steering wheel, you know, the four stroke. Actually, mine's a V6, so the six cylinder engine. Um, and, you know, the, the camshaft, the crankshaft, the fucking... You know, the fucking... I'm trying to think of all these words that sound, sound cool and I don't know why because I'm not a mechanic and I don't try to be, so... It doesn't matter. Everything that makes up the fucking car, even the dust particles that are gathering, all have a collective. And together, it makes up the collective of a car. Now, the better that car is put together, the better the person made that vehicle and added good energy to the collective of the car, the better it will be the worst energy meeting if it was built on a Monday and the person was just pissed off to have to go to work that week or it was built on a Friday and they were in a rush to get it done so they can go home and they put in lousy energy into the work and you know had a bad fucking mood or whatever then you might get a lemon and likewise if they did a good job and they're proud of their job and they like what they do whether it's designing on a computer and putting in the computer program to assemble the car robotically or they actually are on a on a a conveyor belt um, line, basically, uh, fuck, I can't think of the word of anything, but anyways, uh, packing line, production line, um, putting pieces together one by one, you know, if everybody's putting a good collective energy into that, then, you know, you'll have a good car. But nonetheless, everything in this car has a, has atoms that are vibrating, that are moving, just at a slower rate than us, whereas your body are vibrating much faster than this car is anything that's stationary that doesn't move that we seem to be still think is still is not still but compared to how fast we're vibrating um you know anyways why am i going through this well because this is how you consecrate objects and this is how you do healing magic in a matter of speaking now there's a, a big another big aspect to healing magic and that is the more you let go of power and i've said this before too but the more you let go of power, the more you trust your body to do what it's supposed to do. And this is another reason why I didn't even go into the COVID thing. Um, a big episode I was talking about yesterday, the COVID answers. Um, the reason I didn't bother going into it all is because the less people think they need to protect themselves and do healing magic and protective magic, and they just trust their body to keep them safe, and the more safe they are. And it works the same way for... If you're a parent, if you are a boss at work, if you're a manager, if you're a, you know, whether it's just a little shitty fucking diner to a million dollar corporation, if you delegate authority to your people that are under you and you trust them to do the job well, then the job will get done well. And, you know, because if you trust people, they're going to want to do a good job. They're going to be happy that you gave them power. They're going, to be, they're going to be happy that you delegated authority to them. And if they have a good supervisor who delegates authority well and splits up, you know, the power and gives the people the jobs that they're good at and tries to alternate, you know, if there is a shitty job, you know, then those people are going to work great for that boss. Everybody has the days where they don't great work great, of course. And that boss understands that. That's kind of like how my boss Vince is. Um, he's, he's a great guy like that. And maybe not necessarily delegating authority in the sense of giving people jobs but he definitely understands and trusts us to do the work good that he's only there for the day shift and we have an afternoon shift and a night shift where we have no supervision whatsoever and we do the fucking job and we don't ever stop doing the job so if you're a parent and or into magic this is a concept to understand because once again i still think you need to drink the right water you need to breathe the correct way you need some kind of physical exercise. Um, you need to be trying to connect to spirit to some spiritual force. 
whether it's the God you think or a source or nature or whatever, but you need some connection to some spiritual force, it's definitely po powerful and part of it. But you need to hit all aspects of it and you have to have something that you you love and or am passionate with. You know what I mean? You have to use your brain as well. But you have to hit all aspects of that pentagram. You know, spirit being the top, air being the thoughts. Um, it's like your mental state. You need to be doing stuff with your brain to keep it working well. But also you need to be breathing right. That's where the, the east comes in, the air comes in. You know, the fire is passion. What are you passionate about? You have to have a good balance with your sexual needs and desires met meaning you have to release some sexual energy from time to time but you also have to put that sexual energy into something creative and not be giving it out too often and not using it in a creative way because if you have nothing that you do that's creative you're going to have a fucking block there and you're going to be unhealthy and that also comes into play with the blood of your body is fire so you have to have a good blood flow but that's something you gotta trust your body to do on your own because even if you knew how that works even if you're a doctor or a biologist or somebody who studies the anatomy and knows exactly how the blood stays at the 98 degrees throughout your body and circulates to all your organs and all that shit even if you know exactly how that process works you still can't do it any better than i can <laughs> so it's it's one of those things that you can understand all you want but it's not going to help you in any way i mean maybe if you may have technology that can alter someone's blood temperature if it is malfunctioning but anyways um, and then the next one after that's your water. So that's your emotional state. And that also comes into play with the water you add to your body, right? What goes in has to come out. What goes out has to come in. You have to have a good emotional balance. You have to be able to be angry whenever you're angry. Release that charge and not uh, send it to people. Meaning when I get mad at my wife, the beginning of the game, if she's mad at me, then I send it back to her and we just keep going back and forth. Sending each other that negative charge. Some might say that's healthy. I don't think it is. I think, you know, everybody gets in fights. She's got a negative charge because I just said she's mad. She sends it to me. I take it in. What am I supposed to do with it? Well, I need to rep I need to tell her how pissed off I am about why she gave me that negative charge. And then she needs to explain, well, why she gave me that negative charge in the first place. And after we talk it out, the negative charge has been neutralized. And we can be back both in a positive charge or just remain neutral. You know, I probably remain neutral and she probably goes back to a positive charge. But that's how you take care of that. There's the water aspect of your body, and there's your emotional state, and there's probably way more than that, but this is just a, a small little understanding of that just to help out people, and beginners, and maybe intermediates, what I consider myself as being a medium to intermediate slash magical user who understands a lot of concepts and has put a lot of them into play and has gotten various results from good, the bad, the ugly, the fucking downright awesome. So anyways, and that's the water. And then the earth element is would be your physical exercise. So I had the air, which is your breath and your thoughts. I had the fire, which is your blood, your sexual desire, your passion, or what you're passionate about in the blood in your body, obviously. Um, and then the water is, uh, like I said, your emotional balance. The water you drink, you need alkaline water. You need to be putting either a little bit of pink Himalayan sea salt if you can't stand that. Do your research on the lemon things. I know there's a lot of places where they say you add lemon to your water. That makes it alkaline. I've seen some places where it says it does, but it's very small. You need to add a lot. I saw places where I said it's not at all. So do your research on that. But I know 100% if you get Himalayan pink sea salt, the, and I mean, most of them are good. Most, most of the pink Himalayan sea salts you get are good. Obviously, there's always bad eggs that want to fucking um, misguide, mislead people. So there probably is some pink Himalayan sea salt, but everyone I've ever had, I've tested and it's the real pink Himalayan sea salt that has the 82 minerals in it that the body needs. And when you look at how much micrograms that you need a day in these essential minerals, it ain't fucking much. It's a really easy target to hit the amount of micrograms that you need on your daily dose and your daily intake. So don't get all sketched out about that. So that's the water. And then the earth is your physical body. You need to move your physical body. You need to do something that you love doing just for the sake of doing it so your passion what your creative artistic passion maybe you like singing in the car when the radio's on maybe you wish to be a singer but you can't be a singer because you don't have the voice you don't have the training or you're kind of up there in age and you're too scared to go on stage and try so that's fine but that means every time you drive you need to turn on those tunes and you need to sing 
and you need to let that out or when people aren't home or even if they are home you shut your door you turn up your music loud and you just pretend you're on a stage singing or something like that something to get that out and if you can move your body at the same time which would help but you do need to do some kind of exercise whether it's once a month once a week once a day have some kind of regular exercise that you can start slowly expanding so once a month would be a good goal that you can easily add to twice a month it's not hard to go to then three times four times five times and you can see how slowly it, that becomes you know once a week and then twice in one week and then twice in two weeks and then twice in three weeks and twice in four weeks and then all of a sudden that's eight times a month which is basically twice a week which is good so that's how you hit all aspects of that so that's the basics before you start doing healing magic that's what you need to do first is make sure you are healthy in all these areas and if you are doing that and you still have cancer or developing some kind of disease and you are hitting all of these areas well now it's time to talk to the cells of the affected area you need to consecrate your cells to do healing to work properly to kill off all the cells that aren't doing their job correctly and to because if you're trying to heal cells that are killing you, that's just stupid. You need to get over this, well, I don't want to kill anything. All life is precious. And it is. But the cells in your body that are trying to kill you, that'd be like keeping a tick alive that's inside you, about to give you Lyme disease. Like, well, I don't want to kill that tick. You know, it's life is precious too. Yeah, it, it, it was until it started to kill you. And now it needs its karma saying, you know, you can't go around killing people. So since you try to kill me, I'm going to self-defense myself. And kill you off instead now if there's a way to keep you alive so you don't harm other people then i would but if i take you out of me and i leave you alive there's a good chance you're going to go give someone else lyme disease so for the greater good i'll take the little bit of karma that comes along with killing this tick if there is any which i don't think there is and there you go you're dead so start thinking like that the same thing with the cells in your body the cells in your body that are going against you you know you can try to save them don't give it too long to take in if it doesn't start working after a fucking week you switch up you kill them off and you get the cells around the area to start going and this is why all the things i said by hitting the tower on the pentagram are important because if you're putting alkaline water in your body and if you are eating good fucking food which comes into play which would be under probably the physical aspect as well but then you're doing exercise Okay, these things are all important, but the most important is breathing. You really need to detox the carbon dioxide out of your blood. You need to get more oxygen into your blood, and you need to fucking uh, be doing the right breath at the right time. But do all these aspects, um, hit all those aspects, and that'll probably heal up the problem all on its own without even having to talk directly to the cells. But then, once you're there, you need to figure out the right symbolic way to speak to your cells in the affected area that'll happen you know as fast as possible and if you don't know which way that is well you can do some research you can look shit up there's a lot of books you can um the new avatar power i forget the creator or writer but um Frater xavier talked about it one of his biggest healing successes was with that book um and he said it's kind of like hit or miss you know his odds are 50 percent when he uses those methods but they do work. He healed up his um, father-in-law, his wife's father, um, using that book. I've used it and had success. And then I've had some complete, utter failures with it. So, yeah, hit or miss. Um, but I find the easiest way to do healing magic is to do all aspects of the pentagram first. And then from there, you, you talk to the cells. And I'm not going to give you the way I talk to my cells because that's highly personal. But you need to find a line of communication. Now, a long time ago... Chiron, Cryon, uh, whatever his fucking name is, not the part of the astrology chart sign, um, but the part of the guy who does channeling for new age fucking shits. He was talking about how he um, stopped his body from getting older faster. He told the cells instead of doing what they do daily to keep them alive, you know, because if your cells do something every day for the rest of your life, well, if you were to get that same process to happen every two days, well, then that means you could live twice as long. Because every two days, they would do the same thing they do in one day. They wouldn't overexert themselves. You wouldn't need as much food, energy to sustain that. Therefore, if you get that message across to your, all your cells in your body and you adapt to how that process affects you, 
Therefore, in theory, you can live twice as long, meaning every two days your cells are getting just as tired as everybody else's cells are doing in one day, meaning your cells are going to last longer and they're going to need less. I mean, you have two days to give your cells the right energy, the right food that they need to do the processes they were doing in one day, meaning you don't need to eat as much so you can be healthier that way. And there's a whole bunch of aspects come to it. And I'm like, wow, this is before I knew as much as I know now. And I'm like, that's an interesting concept. And the way he went about it is he meditated every day and he went into this visualized state where he was picking up a phone and he was trying to call his cells in his body and talk to the main part. And this is, this is valid. At first I'm like, well, how do you know that works? And I was being all complicated, but that's the way magic works is whatever symbolic representation you want to give something, you can say, okay, I got a master cell in my body that will speak to all my cells at the same time and give the message to all my cells. And that's what I'm trying to call. And every day he goes to the phone, picks up the phone, and no one's there, no one's there, no one's there, no one's there. And all of a sudden, maybe it was a month later, maybe it was a couple of weeks later, he picks up the phone, and his cells were there, and they were listening. And he asked them, and he thanked them, and he said he loved them, and all this shit. And then, boom, he's been healthy ever since. No medical problems, no nothing. Obviously, you get sick from time to time, but that's just your body fighting against some germs, and maybe your body was already fighting against a specific germ, and then you intake too many germs that your body couldn't fight against, so it broke you down, and then your body goes into overdrive, gets a fever, temperature raises up, so it gets super hot to kill off that. Like the same way my furnace at work is super hot to kill off cancer carcinogens, your body does that, so a fever is actually a natural process that is very healthy to the body. Um, so anyway, so that's the way Cryon explained it, and from there I developed my own way of talking to my cells, and I'm not going to give you that. Like I said, it's highly personal, but... Find a symbolic way to speak to your cells that they will hear you and listen and stick to it. Do it every fucking day if you're really serious about this. But when it comes to consecrating an item, you're doing the same thing. So basically, this thing has cells. This thing has atoms. This thing has things that it was, it's made out of that vibrate and has a consciousness that tells it to do that. So it maintains itself. Now, once you are playing too rough with it and you are having too much you're using too much force that this thing can't control see right now i'm putting pressure on it i'm putting force on it and it can withstand the amount i'm ripping but if there was a seam on here or i make a cut in here or then i kill some of those atoms i make it we all the other ones around it weaker and i'm easily able to destroy it and it's because i am my atoms in my body are way stronger than the atoms in this but at the same sense, I can take my atoms in my body, my consciousness, and I can charge up these atoms within this bandana. And I can turn it into a spiritual mask that protects me from everything and anything out there. From cancer to COVID. From herpes to AIDS. From stupid people coming up to me and saying stupid things to finding the right fucking girl you know i can literally cost if i was single and unhappily married and i wanted to cheat on my wife or i just wanted to fuck somebody else or whatever the case is me i'm just single i want a girlfriend i can literally charge this item to help me get laid every time i go out in public see what i mean you can do anything you need to talk to the atoms of this and that's what charging up consecrating your items in magic is what you're doing you are telling the atoms the consciousness of a specific item what you want the specific item to do from now on and the reason you shouldn't reconsecrate things like you got an athame they say to never especially once it's consecrated but even before that you should never cut something with your athame from the physical realm never ever ever do that is what they say it was you know and, that, and i don't and if I have a machete that I was going to fucking consecrate and turn into a fucking sword for, you know, Goetia or whatever. Well, if I cut something outside with it, whether it's a tree, whether it's just playing around with it and I hit something by accident, I will never turn that into a sword. Because it's you've been used to cut something. And then I consecrate. If I have one that I haven't used to cut, cut something, I will consecrate it, meaning I will talk to the atoms, the, the consciousness that th those atoms have that keep it a fucking knife that say we're a knife our job is to be a knife our job is to be a cut well first thing i do is i take salt salt and water and i put it all over it so that i neutralize anybody else's energy that's on it so maybe someone created it and said oh this fucking thing made from china it's a piece of shit and they were the ones that fucking had to connect it together well so 
maybe they're someone who's strong. Maybe they're not someone who's strong. It doesn't matter. But they left a charge on it saying, this thing is a worthless piece of garbage that's going to break in, you know, like five days. And then you buy the item, you take it home, you play with it, and in five days it breaks. Well, I don't want that energy on my items. So I fucking wash it over with salt and water that takes off anybody's energy. Frederick Xavier said something about leaving his shit buried in salt for one, three days sometimes, or even a week, depending on the item and what he wants to do with it. I'll just bury it in salt. Salt is a very powerful thing. From healing your body to get rid of infection to getting rid of entities. And even the church uses salt water in their fucking holy water. That's all it is with either rosemary or some other herb. I can't remember what. But anyways, if you're wondering why rosemary, well, the Rosicrucian, Mary the mother of God. I mean, rosemary's got some pretty powerful fucking things to it. And I, I suggest using that and thyme on your food. I think it's either rosemary or thyme. That really helps while you're cooking uh, red meat to help get rid of carcinogens. I don't have to worry about that because I don't eat red meat. But if you eat red meat, you need to cook with either rosemary or thyme. I can't remember which one. Um, but one of them really reduced the cancer carcinogens while you're cooking the red meat to the point that you don't even have to worry about it. And sometimes all that is is a symbolic thing to tell your mind that you don't have to worry so you don't get something. But whether it actually does it or it's just a trick to trick your mind to saying you're never going to get cancer from red meat because you use this, well, it's a win-win, right? So who gives a fuck? But anyways, so bury your thing and salt, get rid of all that energy. And then from there, you take that item, so you cleanse it. I think three episodes ago, two episodes ago, my podcast, when I did this episode on YouTube, I took that episode and I put it on my podcast. I don't know if it was the first, second, or third, but I generally put three episodes in one on my podcast because I have three hours. And um, the picture for my episode was cleanse, consecrate, and then the other one is cleanse, concentrate. Anyway, the other one is the equivalent of adding your energy to it. Um, charge it. Oh, yeah, cleanse, concentrate, concentrate, and charge. Because they're all C's, right? Even though the one's charge is C-H, but it's all three. It's the three C's. Right? You cleanse it, you consecrate it, and then you charge it up. So, first thing you do, you take all the energy off this fucking bad boy. Your face mask, right? The second thing you do is you consecrate it. So, within a ritual setting, you fucking hold it out. After you do your middle, after you do your, well, you've opened up, you call in the fucking, uh, the quarters, the elements of the quarters, um, you know, first you do your catalytic cross, and first you make your fucking circle, I shouldn't have to go through all this, but I feel like I have to, you make your fucking circle, do your catalytic cross, you're in the fucking space, you're visualizing other the planets going around you where the, the corresponding chakras are, and you're a fucking giant, and there are little tiny fucking things going around you, at either fast speeds or slow speeds, depending on what you want to do, or just right in front of you doing that shit to your fucking physical body, and you're another part of it, you're the astral body, you're the soul, so you're not actually connected to your body, but it still helps to visualize that, but anyways, um, because then you're getting used to seeing the planets as your chakras, and then you can call on specific ones, because you visualize it so often that it's now real, and then you can speak directly to where Jupiter is, where Saturn is, if you have to affect it, especially for healing magic, that also helps. But anyways, because I'm not unconvinced that the battery packs, the doctor I was listening to, Jerry Tennant, there's a battery pack for every quadrant of your body where all the cells have to listen to and where the cells get their energy from and that battery pack is energized by the water you drink by how you breathe and by the food you eat so if you're not putting the right shit in your battery packs aren't good in your body and if your battery packs aren't good in your body they can't charge up the cells if the cells don't have enough electricity then they can't heal and keep reproducing and do the job correctly so i'm not unconvinced that the corresponding chakra is not where the battery pack would be getting its spiritual energy from so anyways but that's a whole other video all on its own. So you take this within a ritual setting after you do your, your fucking middle pillar. After you've already done, you do your middle pillar. After you've already done your lesser vanity, your pentagram. And if you do the hexagram ritual, well, then you do that. If you're doing the watchtower ritual, opening and closing, well, you would have done the opening part already, at least, I believe. Potentially even the closing one. Um, I don't know how I would do that. I think I would consecrate this actually before I do that. But nonetheless, um... I'm not going to get into that because, well, I haven't even been doing that fucking ritual for a lot. I haven't even been doing ritual for a lot of time. But anyways, I'm not going to get into my issues. But so you take this fucker and you put it out in front of you. You know, you're facing east most likely at this point. You should be facing east anyways. And if you're laying down, 
facing whatever way you lay down while you just visualize visualize yourself playing these two arms out and you fucking say whatever fucking consecrating words that you have to say look it up there's many books that will tell you how to do it the book i gave the pdf i gave um my last video not my last video my last two videos three videos but anyways the one i talk about summoning spirits i put the pdf in there i put like three or four other pdfs on that one that are all fucking good and at least two out of those four books will tell you how to consecrate an item so just go look at that i shouldn't have to tell you this shit you shouldn't have to get everything from somebody else you should know a little bit of this shit already otherwise you shouldn't be consecrating items but consecrate yourself a fucking bandana use it as a fucking face mask that this thing will protect you from all things and it won't restrict your fucking oxygen don't say won't but say this mask is free from restricting my oxygen it is free from increasing my carbon monoxide um levels in my body and is free from putting me in the sympathetic nervous system it is free from putting me into the fight or fight response it is free from um free from affecting my immune system capability and it allows me to stay safe when i'm out in public around the fucking swine that don't know anything <laughs> i will be harm free so fucking mode it be and boom now you got to charge it so that's what i would do and i would close that i would close temple that's consecrating it then you need to look up how you charge an item how you charge an item so i would say and you can start wiring it right away i mean that's for debate right that's up to debate but um the way you charge an item is also going to be in that book i mentioned so look it up but you know to consecrate items and they say to charge or keep the energy on items like my awards and shit that i keep in my pocket all the time which i don't have right now which is why i probably broke my fucking necklace but anyways obviously i didn't consecrate and charge that thing right or i did and it broke because something is trying to attack me and that's what happens with necklaces wards that you wear around your neck most often when something's trying to attack you this thing will protect you but yet it'll break it'll break and that tells you it protected you but the thing took it out malevolence always takes a piece of you remember that if someone's attacking you they are going to get a piece of you they're not going to win the battle but they will win a fight and the fight they win when it comes to a necklace for is the fucking thing breaks and you gotta either fix it or buy a new one but anyways look how to charge your item after okay and then once it's charged and once you've waited the appropriate amount of time if there's a time to wait it depends on the spell but mainly what matters is that you believe that this fucking works and then the more you wear this out in public and the more you know it's fucking real and don't tell anybody you're doing this because if they think well it's just a fucking thing how can that protect you their mind is involved in it now so when it's only your mind and only your mind that knows this thing's protecting you right making a fucking sigil on it for protection or transformation is a great fucking idea and if you don't want it to show up on there put it on the inside put it in a fucking marker that uh, lights up I don't know to hide it somehow but put a sigil on here for transformation as well you charge that bitch up you fucking consecrate that bitch up and oh, you're golden there's so many ways to protect yourself so this isn't necessarily a loophole to not wear a mask but this is a way to have something over your face by following the rules and protecting yourself and it all matters on how much you believe in this shit but anyways I'm gonna leave it at that so make sure you do your homework find out how to consecrate find out how to fucking charge an item and then find yourself something you like it doesn't have to be a black man yet it could be a fucking it could be a medical face mask if you want to use it you know go for it you know i got a bunch of them in the car in case we need them i got well, i had one up there i guess my wife used it or something but oh, this is only one actually fucking charge one of these stupid fucking dumb things up you know the face mask isn't the enemy the enemy is the person making you wear the face mask but anyways i'm gonna go half an hour long plus the minute fucking video before this that's enough for today i put too much information out yesterday so I have to go in and take care of my daughter. Anyways, thank you all for watching. I love everybody who watches, and I really appreciate anybody who subscribes. But even if you're just watching me and you're not ready to subscribe or you don't want to subscribe, that's fucking fine too. I really do appreciate each and every one of you that have subscribed or haven't subscribed. The fact that you watch my stuff, I really do appreciate it. And I hope you have a great fucking day, and I wish you all to have a safe fucking rest of this COVID fucking pandemic. And try not to put too much focused energy into COVID because then it can make it bigger. Have a great one. All right. Holy fuck. 
Oh, what are we going to talk about today? Well, yesterday I didn't get into the sigil magic part. So I got to do that. There's a couple other parts that I didn't get into. I'm trying, I'm drawing a blank on right now. Before I talk about the sigil magic part of how this limbic system and this trigger mechanism, whenever you are in too much other fear, too much positive emotion, and it causes your brain to go back one second and capture everything you are using your five senses, basically. That's what I was trying to say yesterday. I couldn't say it right. Maybe it's because I'm still all worked up about the fucking deadbeat fucking father of my stepchildren. But anyways, um, so your brain goes back one second and takes a picture of everything that's around you. And it takes a, don't ask me how, but it takes a, also a picture, but it'd be like a smelling picture, a picture that, um, records the smell, a picture that records the sound. See, we can record audio and visual, but we can't necessarily, I mean, maybe with virtual reality right now, but virtual reality, I don't think you can touch and smell and, uh, feel, but you know, Technically, your brain can do those things. It can record what something feels like. It can record what something tastes like. It can record what something um, feels, tastes, um, smells like. Those are the other three besides the hearing and the sound. I think anyways. I remember it's because I was learning about the neocortex. The neocortex is that part of the brain. Now, the thing I wanted to speak about with the Alan Watts I'm still working on because, man, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a big blowout, and I know I do this often and say I'm making this big episode, and then I never release it, and it's just because it's just too much. To be honest with you, the COVID thing was a great episode. How to protect yourself is how I was playing it in, but then I was trying to figure out how to ultimately protect yourself from COVID, and then it comes to find out that there's nothing to fucking worry about. Like everybody has a mechanism around them, and. If you guys are watching these and you're witches and mag magical practitioners, you know, or maybe I got the odd truth or who isn't into magic yet. But if you're not into magic, you're not really going to be drawn to my stuff, you know, because my stuff's not great to start with. Good information from time to time, but it's not great. So I, I guess I'm being self-defecating, but, you know, someone who doesn't like what I like or who doesn't do what I do, it's not going to really watch my stuff. So if you guys are watching my stuff, then you are, you know, doing some kind of magical training. Therefore, your aura your um a magnetic uh field that your heart creates around your body you should be getting that stronger you should be reducing your karma you should be stop saying uh self curses which is negative self-talk basically and this way you're not going to allow anything through there so you really have nothing to worry about so i didn't want to over complicate it for one by giving you a bunch of information that can make you overthink things two i didn't want to add any more um awareness and give any more focused attention to covid than it needed so i was trying to stop all things unless uh, something that really was pissing me off i had to talk about but for the most part i just kind of stopped you know from time to time i'll tell you how stupid things are about covid but you know anyways which reminds me about today because now in my hometown Cornwall, ontario canada um the health unit or health fucking whatever they are the people are making these laws for fucking covid which if you don't want to wear a mask do your research and go look to see if they passed the bill in the house of commons yet and if there's any kind of charge if it's being enforced by your mp your your mayor make sure i mean most of the time the mayor's on board with it it's up to it's at the municipal municipal level here in canada for them to decide so if you're in this country where you have a population of like probably a thousand or less there's probably no issue but i think if you're over twenty thousand, then they're implementing masks and now that probably depends on how big your town is if you got a big fucking space a town a city the size of toronto but you only have forty fucking thousand people then you're not gonna be close enough to do anything but if your town is small then you say you got a thousand people but you're like a fucking i don't know a little shit fucking town that's basically like maybe 10 blocks squared and or any regular town that's your whole town well then you know they're probably gonna make you do it because you guys are so condensed but right now it's in effect everybody has to wear a mask wherever they're going now at the moment it's only been like the second or third day they've implemented it i believe it's been since monday maybe sunday and so if you don't have one 
especially if you're going somewhere to buy shit, obviously they're going to have masks on hand for people. They might run out. They might not have enough. They might not want to dip into the stock that they're selling. Um, but if it means kicking out a customer who's going to buy a bunch of groceries because they don't have one mask, well, regardless of everywhere else is making people wear masks, they are going to leave that business pissed off. I'm not buying anything from here. I'll put a mask on and go to Walmart. Fuck this store, you know? Or I'll put a mask on and I'll go to fucking wherever. Fucking No Frills, Food Basics, Independent, fucking fuck Canadian Tire, you know, who knows, but I know that's probably the case, I'm probably going to give you masks, but if you're going somewhere that's not taking enough money from you, or it's non-profit or something like that, then if you don't get a mask, you're going to get the boot, they'll probably have some leeway for a few days, in case not everybody knows about it, like right now there's a gentleman at the front door, he's probably into YouTube and shit like that, so he probably doesn't believe in the whole mask thing, and you know, I think I'm right, he's on the phone talking to somebody, he's young enough, so... Um, but yeah, he's got no fucking mask on and he doesn't even have pockets on his pants because he's got the fucking jogging pants with no pocket. Oh, well, he's putting his phone in something. So maybe he does have one in his pocket. And he feels real uncomfortable right now because he's like, fuck, they're going to make me put on a mask and I got no fucking mask. I'm saying everywhere it's the law. Shit. He's got a toque on and some nice sandals and he's got this swagger walk. And <laughs> anyways, uh, he's probably somebody I'd get along with too. But anyways, so... It's bullshit. I fucking hate it. I had to wear a mask today. Fuck, man. I wore it at the hospital. But the hospital is the hospital. Once again, that's what I'm talking about. Non-profit, right? I mean, yeah, our taxes go to the hospital and all that. So technically, we do pay for it. But, and the nurses will be like, you want to get fucking served, bud? Put a fucking mask on or else, you know? You know? You're at their whims there. It's not like you're going in there giving them money like a fucking store. At a, at a store, technically, the reason the customer is always right is because you're the one paying for the party. You know, and giving them the money to make this shit run. So, yeah, okay. They may not need you as in one person's money, but they need you as in all person's money. Therefore, if one person makes a big enough stink, has a big enough fan base, has, can give them bad publicity, well, then, yeah, I could fuck them right up. You know, so so this is why they give you more leeway. But a hospital, is like, no, people are coming here no matter what. People need, especially in my town, we have one hospital. Even if you hate the motherfuckers, now if you have an emergency, that's where you gotta go. And you don't want to bite the hand that fucking fixes your broken hand. So, all that to say is, that's why I wear my mask. I wear my mask whenever I, I don't want to go out, which isn't fair to my wife that I'm just gonna boycott all places because I don't want to wear a mask. That's not really putting up a protest. That's just bitching out. So you know, fuck me. I hate this shit. I really think it's stupid. It feels so unnatural wearing a mask. It's not right. And I understand why people got personalized masks now because the fucking ones they give you, the free ones, the fucking surgical dumb shit ones, are just so fucking blue and weird looking and like, ugh. It's terrible. Everybody covering up their fucking face like it's stupid. Oh, you know, and I was just starting to think that maybe they are doing this for the greater good. Maybe they really do believe there's a fucking pandemic because of these other places. I don't think it ever got over here, man. I really don't. But anyways, enough about that. And I know that's polarizing, and I know people are not going to watch me just because I'm against it. I don't give a shit. You know? Uh, that's what people who have channels that are trying to get fans, don't ever cover your shit up. Ralph Smart, you know? I, I love the guy. He's awesome. And his last video was like, the art of not giving a damn, man. It was fucking awesome. It was fucking awesome. One of his best ones yet, to me anyways. And like his last few have all been inspiring. And, you know, the one before this one was really good for anybody who isn't making any money online yet in some way, shape, or form. Like I've said before, I've got a couple small little revenue streams. My my podcast giving me small revenue, even though now I'm not even making any original episodes. I'm still making episodes, but they're the same things that I'm putting on here just two or three videos in one um and that's just for the people who listen to my podcast who don't watch my youtube but um i got a couple more things going on from e-commerce a store and a few other things that make me like i said fucking twenty dollars a day at the end of the week you know it's about a hundred fucking bucks every week and that's without even trying updating doing much so Kiki has a lot of good tips and ideas of different ways if you didn't know how to make money online. So not, if he comes out with a video today, obviously not today's video, 
not yesterday's video, but Monday's video was really fucking informative and good for anybody trying to make money online, trying to know how do you make money online, what do you do, you know? And, uh, you know, his was more generated towards people with content, but there was also a ways on there without having content um, that you can do. And, yeah, it was great. I've talked about, I think, most of those ways in some way, shape, or form, and never all in one video like him, so. But nonetheless, back to sigils and the mind. So yesterday I went through neocortex. <sighs> Sorry. <sighs> neocortex. Whenever you are experiencing too much negative emotion, this is when it mostly happens because we, and not mostly, as in it doesn't happen as often with positive emotion. It does. Um, no, not really. It happens more with negative emotion because most people ex um, experience negative emotion more often than positive emotion, especially in our days with the media constantly telling you not so much anymore. I mean, not where I am because no one's dying. No one has died where I live. Not a single fucking person. But, but yeah, we got like 300,000 fucking cases of it and no one died from it. You know, that's good odds. Fuck. That tells me that. Poor shit. But anyways. Um, so yeah, things like that. When the media is bombarding you with fucking fear-based media at 24 fucking 7 to the point where you're scared to go outside where everybody's got a fucking mask when they go out. And I said that before, the mask is the symbolism part of magic. Meaning when you do magic, it's the robes, the candles, the fucking wands, the athames, everything in ritual magic that's different from your everyday life is there to make it stand out, to impress on your subconscious mind, to show your subconscious mind that you are doing something out of the ordinary and this way it gets through to your subconscious mind so that you can implant a suggestion into your subconscious mind and it can play out in your reality. So you wear a robe or you go naked. You know, that's like, whoa, why the fuck is he naked? You know, and that's why, um, that's maybe why the robe might work better than naked. And I've never talked about that, but ceremonial magicians wear a robe. White robe to start. Clip off magicians start with a black. Well, they wear all black. You can have a black robe if you want, but it's all black. And that would be arguably probably the starting point. Had I known that, I'd be doing that first, but I was too polarized to look at the clip off, so. But I never did that. <sighs> Being a witch, I always went in my birthday suit. Um, well, not at first because it was in my garage. But actually, you know, I stripped down in my garage a few times and fucking did magic and did my ritual story in the nude. I had to block the windows and all that, but block the fucking doors and no one says, hey, babe, what are you doing? What the fuck are you naked in your candles doing? Are you masturbating in the garage? Like, get the fuck out, babe. Like, <laughs> talk about fucking it all up and creating a fucking negative thought form. But anyways, and that's the thing. If you're doing ritual magic and you're thinking about your magic not working, I played this the other day from the book Summoning Spirits. That's why it's in my head. But if you're doing a ritual and in your head you're thinking at the same time, oh, this is not going to fucking work. There's no way this is going to fucking work. Well, because you are drawing down energy from the astral, especially if you've already done your middle pillar, okay, um, and you purified the space for no other thought forms to be there, so there's nothing... I mean, you got the archangels there. Maybe they'll save your ass if you already call them into being, but no, they're there to put so nothing attacks you personally. But if you're creating something, that's kind of what they're expecting. So if you're going to think a negative thought, that's your negative emotion, that's the thing that's going to fucking give it life. You just took down astral energy into you and you put that energy into the thoughts that you're creating right there and the will as you're doing the fucking the ritual so if at the same time as you're doing a ritual to get money and you think oh this is never going to work then you can create a thought form called this is never going to work and his job is going to be to stop your fucking magic so anybody who's ever done that do yourself a favor and do a ritual to kill off any of those and it could be many if you've done this many times. Any of those things that you have um, around you so that your magic works. Because I clearly don't have that because mine are fucking working. 
I think I might have done the opposite. I think I might have made a thought form for my magic always works. Because I've been to my ritual a few times saying, like, fuck, man, I don't even think I have to do this because it already happened. Like, oh, I went to my ritual, I forget what it was for. But I went there the other day, like, probably a month ago, and it was for something that I was thinking about. I fucking I'm going through a ritual. But, you know, I didn't even get past the fucking Kabbalistic cross. And I got a knock on the door saying, hey, babe, no worries. Fucking this check just came in or something like this just came in. I was like, holy fuck, I didn't have to do the ritual. But I was so overwhelmed with joy that the whole fucking uh, ritual, I was like continuously thinking about, man, I don't even need to do ritual because my magic always works. So I probably created a thought form that it already works. That is called my magic always works and his job is to make sure my magic always works. So and there's, these are things you can do. There's nothing that's, that's um, bad. There's nothing that you can't do. When you're a magician, you can literally create a fucking thought form that makes your fucking thoughts manifest. Now, I was trying to, I, I, I was under the assumption that I made, I did rituals to make sure my magic only manifests while I'm in a circle, whether it's a mental circle in my head at the couch sleeping, but I'm still at my altar, or it's literally standing in front of my altar. Those are the only times I can do it. Now, once I'm at my altar, I can visualize myself somewhere else because that's sometimes useful. That which means if I want to do a nature fucking ritual, I can not I can go outside and do nature rituals. But while I'm in nature, I got to see myself in front of my altar. And it's like a verification code when you're trying to get... Because, like, technically going to your altar is... Is your, is your passcode to get into your Facebook, into your fucking, your, your email, your Google, your YouTube account, right? But if anybody can ex access your phone, then they can get into your Google. If everything's saved on there with just your password, and your password's also saved on there, right? So if you want extra protection, well, you get the thing that sends you a verification code. And when it sends you the verification code, you can verify it in this way. If someone else is trying to get onto your Google, then you know about it. Well, that's kind of like this is. So if I'm gone somewhere and someone goes to my altar and tries to manifest something, well, they won't be able to. It's my altar, first of all. But I just just a metaphor. And the metaphor is if I'm out somewhere, well, the second line of defense so that I don't manifest something by mistake somewhere else was that I have to visualize myself at my altar so I don't manifest something by accident. All right, but um, what first? First of all, the one thing I was gonna say about before I got into Ralph Smart was what I got from his video was to not if you're trying to get fans, and then you don't want to say things because you're scared you're gonna lose fans. Don't. You might lose a subscriber now here and there, but ultimately they're either gonna come back. Or you'll get two more um, if you are, if you're being real, you're being honest, even if, like, who knows? The shit I say might not be real, you know? Maybe what I think, so I to speculate. If someone doesn't like it, they go somewhere else, that's fine. I am, however, worried about when I added Facebook, then it's more localized and people are trying to add me that they know me because it's a suggestion. You know this guy from Cornwall, Ontario? I can't get that out of there or else he wants to let go of my account. So, I am worried about that. And not for me, I don't give two fucks about my kids. No way. But ultimately, they all say they don't give a fuck, so I don't give a fuck. People don't like it in this day and age where everybody's wearing a fucking mask because they're scared of a virus and they think ceremonial witchcraft is fucking weird. Well, I got news for them. They're fucking weird. They think wearing a mask in a store is okay and listening to the news anchors is just okay going along with the media. Now, there's no way to know right now if all this, the news is bullshit shit we've been listening to up until coronavirus was just that implanting the seed so that when this happens, there's enough of us that are against it and it's just a way to start a revolution. But that being said, maybe it needs to be started because there's a lot of things they fucking say. Like, isn't now some of the news anchors on mainstream TV are even saying COVID's bullshit. So one thing I do know is everybody wearing a mask in the summertime is going to make them twice as sick in the wintertime. Twice as likely to die. And let's say we have a fucking cold winter coming. Let's say we have a fucking ice age coming. Which, you know, I used to say that was coming too. And 
Um, anyways, I'm not going to get into that, but let's say we have a really bad winter and people are twice as vulnerable if we're wearing a fucking mask all the time and you're not breathing correctly all the rest of the time, then yeah, you're going to get twice as sick. So if you are wearing a mask because, well, Jesus, now you have to, um, then do yourself a favor and breathe through your nose only with that mask. Make sure it's loose enough that airflow can get in and good airflow and try to make sure you, you're Use your nose. <laughs> That's the best thing I can say. I don't want you fucking with the mask, put a hole in the mask with some shit until your air gets out. Although you could do that, tiny pin fucking holes where the mouth is that they can't see that might give you a better airflow out. Um, but in and out through your nose all the time. Go home. Do it out, do it out. Uh, deep, long breaths. Ted talks some fucking breath shit. Three or four first videos should be the best ones. Um, and if not, go down until you find one you like. But they'll explain how to do breathing exercises, why it's important. And you'll be able to put it together. They might even have some now, but wearing a mask all the time. Who knows? Uh, and if not, someone should make one. But um, I fuck if I could, I would. But I'm not any uh, esteemed anything in my field. I don't have a field. My field is magic. And magic isn't in a recognizable field, I guess, yet. But even then, if it was... I'm only four years into it, so I mean, I'm nowhere near a fucking OG or a fucking, you know, a fucking truth or a fucking adept or anything. Anyways, but so that's what I'm trying to get at. Don't cover up your shit because you're scared to lose fans. You'll gain more fans. If you're saying something polarizing that makes you lose fans, first of all, that person who you lost is going to send you negative energy that you can use for anything, so that's always great. You might actually gain more fans if you're pissing people off. And that's energy you can use for anything. And on top of that, you'll gain more fans in the long run. Especially on YouTube. But anywhere you're making videos or podcasts, you're going to get more people if you're pissing off the status quo than if you're going with the status quo. I love Frederick Xavier. I'll never turn on him. But whenever he starts talking about COVID being, you know, everybody should just listen and stay home, and, you know, I know he's got a thing against germs, not as bad as, like, Howie Mandela, and that's his own example he's used, but he's got a thing against germs, so anytime there's a, a virus germ, he's gonna be more polarized to say people are fucking stupid for going against the grain, and why would he even look at that whenever he's got this, you know, childhood fucking fear that, you know, or issue, let's say, and I don't blame them. Germs are a real thing. And germs are what make you sick. But technically you need germs to beat fucking germs as well. So. Um, and in that line of thought. This is where the mask is a bad thing. Because you're wearing a mask too much. You're not taking germs. There's no fucking way shape or form. Am I going to keep a mask on my kids. Nor will I force them to wear a fucking mask. Anywhere. And if they take it off, they take it off and say, you can try telling my kid to put the mask on. And if you step out of line, I'll punch you in the face. But if, you know, you can get them to wear the mask and keep it on, then by all means, give it a shot. But make sure you don't step over the line because you're going to get a fucking fist to the face because that's my fucking kids there. And I don't want to fucking tell them because I know it's not good for you. But anyways, you know, we have all this talk about doctors pushing pills because they're, they can't, they're under contract to only push this pill. And most people know that. Most people will tell you that. Even people that are wearing masks today, and people that are not, or are, are people that are listening to the news avidly, will tell you that they know that doctors are under contract with certain companies. And they get a kickback, and they know this. This is like general information. At least in my town, it is. Most people will tell you that. My mom will tell you that. People I meet at the store will tell me that. All everywhere, okay. And these same people will believe. The doctors, when they tell you to wear a mask, and they're not going to say anything sideways, even though there's other doctors out there who haven't signed a deal or get a kickback with a fucking face mask company to do so. But it's no different for them pushing one company or another, whether it's pills or fucking face masks and gloves. It doesn't matter. Someone's getting profit from that. So it's just advertising. You're paying doctors for advertising. And they can't go against it. And if they do, it's off the record and it's not usable on the media. And the ones that don't have a deal are the ones that are speaking out against it. Simple as that. Because any doctor who doesn't have a deal with somebody to say wear a mask, who isn't young and who isn't so naive to know, will know that you're restricting your oxygen flow. It's as simple as that. You're inhaling your carbon dioxide and that's not good. When you have too much carbon dioxide in your blood, it's 
very problematic. Absolutely. And you have these sensors in your body that whenever you have too much carbon dioxide in your body, among many other triggers and things that happen, but one of them is it activates the sympathetic nervous system, which activates you to breathe in such a way that will re release um, cortisol throughout your body, which is a stress hormone. Because when you do that, it makes you breathe faster to intake more oxygen. It's not focusing on getting rid of the carbon dioxide. The reason for this is because you have to intake as much oxygen. Uh, you need just as much oxygen in to get rid of carbon dioxide. So if you have too much carbon dioxide in your levels, well, your body knows to start at the beginning. Okay, we need to focus on getting rid of carbon dioxide. But if we start slow breathing, then he might fall asleep because that's the one going to breath. So let's intake as much oxygen as we can. So when it's time to deep breathe, we have so much oxygen in our body that we can release the carbon dioxide. So by getting you to intake more and more and more carbon dioxide, there are, uh, they are starting up your, your uh, fight or flight response, basically, in a manner of speaking. And if you don't go home and do like I said, focus on deep breathing and get rid of all the carbon dioxide you intake extra because you're already getting some i'm getting some right now i'm getting carbon monoxide too from the smoke but my levels are fucking great and it's because i never wore a mask but anyways go home focus on your breathing get rid of all the carbon dioxide do yourself a favor so when winter time comes if we do have a bad fucking winter if this shit is like the game of thrones which i don't think it is but and these fuckers are coming to kill us and it's going to be a cold ass fucking winter well, you might want to be healthy for that shit and not be a fucking idiot. When fall comes, get your ass outside and breathe. When winter comes and you can stand it, get your ass out and start fucking breathing. And get as many fucking germs in you as you can. Don't allow anything to get you sick. Don't allow any of the bullshit to get in your fucking head either. Because that's the worst thing you can do. Is tell people, say, you know, if I get sick, I get sick, so be it. Really? No. I don't get sick. I never get fucking sick. Start saying that shit. That's a good affirmation to have. I never get sickness, illness, disease, infection, or viruses. I will be hunt free, so fucking mode it be. Thank you, gods and goddesses. Thank you, universe. Thank you, all that is, for never allowing me, sorry, for allowing me to be free from sickness, illness, disease, infection, and viruses. You that bitch if you're really worried about this shit. Use it all the time. Use it every day. Use it every time you're out in public. Over and over and over in your head if you're alone. If you're with somebody, put on one headphone and one ear and have it playing on a fucking thing. Just have it going in your head this way when you're interacting with people and doing shit, you know? I don't get sick from wearing a mask. Or I am free from sickness from wearing a mask. Say that shit over and over and over again so you can counteract the effects of the fucking mask. Do that shit. That shit will fucking help. That will help large. And this guy just got denied because he had no fucking mask. Even though my wife said there's a bunch of people in there that have no fucking mask on right now. But it's just rebellion. Going in there with a mask on, taking the mask off, going to the couch with a mask on kind of thing. Which is probably what I'm going to fucking do if she ever forces me to go in a place because she wants to walk around as a couple. But fuck that shit. Okay, anyways, I got to focus. What are the other things I needed to talk about? Uh, I said... Never... The fuck did I fucking talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ended up on the whole naked fucking thing with the robes. Oh, and back to the mask. Fuck, man. See, what you're around is what you're going to be talking about. It's almost inevitable. But one of the things I remember I wanted to say is because I was getting to the symbolic sim symbolism of the mask. Okay, and I know people say it's symbolic. Shut the fuck up. And tell people that you know don't talk, don't talk. And maybe that's right. But to me. Knowing ritual magic, okay? When I was talking about creating that thought form, your will was you doing this operation, this ritual. That's why ritual magic is the shortcut to the affirmation realm. Because the affirmation realm is saying something over and over and over again to the point where it made its picture in your head. So it's creating that thought, that idea, the symbolism. It's a symbol in your head now, that picture. And then you eventually put emotion into it. Uh, but doing something so often over and over and over and over and over again just gets into your head. That's how this thing ha that's how this happens. Um, but ritual magic is putting emotion into thought with the will, with your will, with the fucking fire, okay? It's air, fire, and water create something that can be on this earthly realm. So, 
when you're out in the store is like I just said about the whole robe thing. The robe is a symbolism. Going naked is a symbolism. Using your athame is a symbolism. This is why if you incorporate candles, you know, fire with wax and water, earth, when you have incense and you have some kind of water and you're adding your own motion, but if you can incorporate all the elements within your ritual, it makes it that much more potent because you use a symbolism within symbolism. The more symbolism you can incorporate, the better. Just don't make it overcomplicated, okay? The simpler, the better, but the more you can incorporate and keep it simple is also better. But the mask is, like I said, the robe tells your mind, oh, okay, he's doing something different. You get in a relaxed trance state. This is why incense is so important. If you've never understood why, well, incense represents air, thought, spirit. Um, and it puts you in the type of mindset that actually helps. That actually helps you relax and get to a trance-like state. It's like watching lights. It's like watching water. It's like watching fire. It relaxes you. Same thing with the fucking candles. We got a light on there stimulating you, keeping you awake. As most of our lights, especially LEDs, are made to keep you awake. They're not made to put you to sleep. That's why insomnia has activated. Not only that, it doesn't offer any protection. Go back to the older light bulbs if you're worried about activity and you want more protection. But more than that, use a fucking uh, oil lamp, especially if you need to add colors to shit, and or you add, um, or you're using candles, one or the other, okay? Those are the best ways to go. But the mask symbolizes that something has changed. And so there's your symbolism, That's which is what... Oh, oh shit, I'm about to lose my lighter. Oh, don't do it. All right. So, symbolism I'm trying to get to. I was trying to just make a point. Um, and I go off on everything like I do. But, point was, everything during ritual magic is symbolic. The candles have any powers? No. I mean, using the elements is important because elemental magic... I mean, none of this... Think what you want to think, and I don't want to tell anybody to believe anything, right? There's earth spirits, there's fire spirits, there's air spirits, there's water spirits, elements, the elementals. Yes, we're using all this in our magic, technically, because they are things, they are something, but at the same time, it's all just fucking uh, symbolic in your mind to impress on your subconscious. Now, does that mean that there's no power in any of these things? That these things are all just mundane and just a way to tell your mind stuff? I don't know. I don't completely buy that. I think there's something more to it than that. And that might be why it activates something in your mind and why it's used to speak to your mind. So, I mean, in, in one sense, that's 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 that's, why, that's how I'm looking at it these days anyways. Is, you know, if you're fucking doing magic, all the extra stuff, everything on your altar is for your mind. And then, when you're doing a, an initiation, a curriculum, well, after you pass the earth grade, you get the pentacle. After you pass the uh, water grade, you get the cup. After you pass the, the, the fucking air grade, you know, you get the fire wand. No, no, no. Uh, fire dagger, or the air dagger, or the air wand, and then fire grade, whatever. And then depending on the other grades, depending on your system, it all basically varies, but... Depending on your system, that's how this shit kind of works. So, all that's to say is when you do ritual magic, you have symbolic uses of symbolism to get things into your mind better. What is using a sigil? A sigil is symbolically putting a statement in your mind using a sigil. So, you wrote down something, a statement of intent. Subconscious mind records all. So, it knows what you wrote down. Then you turn that sigil into a symbol, okay? Once you turn that into a symbol, it still knows all the letters that was taken into account. You won't remember it consciously unless you do it every day for seven days, which is how I used to do it, by the way. I used to do a, a sigil for seven days, and then I'd activate it on the seventh day, and I'd have all these different sigils, and the rest of them I'd leave around the house, and it works. But... You know, depending on how your memory works, you might remember what the sigil means um, later on because you did it so often. Because for me, I can hear a song once or twice and I'll know almost all the lyrics. Like I just proved that to my wife today. She put on her music for once in the car, which, you know, I normally always put on mine. 
like she's putting on different songs that I kind of like and not country. Not that there's anything wrong with country, it's just not my taste. But, and then um, I knew most of the songs. I was like, how do you do that? I don't know, pick a random song, babe. You should pick the one that I went, no. And then I sang the chorus. I sang the first verse. The second verse, I had trouble. And the last verse, like, hook, not hook, that's chorus. But bridge, whatever it is, it's like something is not as repetitive as the chorus, but close thereabouts. Um, <laughs> so anyways, and I knew that. So I knew the fucking three quarters to two thirds of the song. And I've heard that twice, maybe three times that I know of. But my subconscious mind has always been good at recording songs and I'm very good and talented at getting that info back. And maybe it's because when I'm listening to music, I'm always doing something else. Do you ever think about that? When you're watching a movie and you can remember other movies and movie lines and shit like that, well, what are you doing? Well, your movie's a little different because you're sitting down to watch a movie. But if you have a movie on while you're fucking or a movie on while you're sleeping, or, and, you know, and you know the movie by heart and you've only seen it once or twice, well, that's why. You've got this connection to your subconscious mind when it comes to stuff that you've implanted there yourself on purpose that you can access. That's what I can do, and that's the only explanation for it. It's not like I can... I mean, I've always been good at memorizing, and my mom did a lot of training with me to memorize stuff at school but as a kid so I got good at memorizing and maybe that's where it comes into play so my mom did all this exercise work with me doing my timetables real fast doing my additions when I was even younger mostly timetables and, and multi or multiplication and division mostly but and you know should we get that in my subconscious mind through repetition over and over again doing it and it's like it's like a muscle when you work out a muscle it gets bigger, it gets stronger, it gets better. So that's what happened. And now, because of all those tests that I aced, because of my mom, well, I didn't just do that shit. I wasn't thinking about multiplication. I mean, I was before the test, but the point is, the ones I had to really think about, I can use my mind, I can draw on, I told you guys before, I have like a, not, necessar not necessarily a photographic memory, but I can go back in my head if I know the day, there's a song playing, if there's a movie, if there's something I need to know, and go back to the day when it happens. And if I remember situational information about that day when something happened more or less there, and then I can go right back to see, remember, babe, this is what you said, and then I said this, and then that's when you said this, because she's denying she said something, or I didn't say it like that. It's not what I said. I'm like, oh, yeah, remember how it happened? Last Wednesday, we were talking about this, and then I brought up the fact that Austin did this, and then you said, no, 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 and then she's like, oh, and she fucking hates it. Everybody does, and then sometimes she'll just straight up lie and say, no, no, that's not true. You can't remember all that. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I fucking can, and I do, and I just did. And, I don't know, maybe it's part of my mom, maybe gave me practice that part of her brain as a kid. So, as I grew up, when I stopped using it for multiplication, well, when my subconscious mind is really active, because I'm driving right now, this is why I like driving and speaking, because I'm actually doing something with my conscious mind. My conscious mind is driving. Or my subconscious, who knows? And then I'm trying to use my conscious mind to talk, but normally what's gonna happen is the more important thing is gonna get the conscious mind because the things it needs to focus in, the subconscious is gonna do the other one. So depending on which one I put importance in my videos of this, anyways, it's more closer to the surface. But the same thing goes for when I'm in the car listening to music, every song that plays, even if you turn it way down, you know, as long as there's a volume there, you can record that. And everybody can draw on that, they just gotta figure out what they need to do to to get at those memories, to get at that information. And when you start doing this shit, well, it's way more wide open. I've never been as good as I am right now at pulling information out of my ass and knowing songs and remembering fucking fights and things my wife said than I have ever been in the last, well, two years, let's say. Not the whole four fucking years because the first year was just crap. Uh, me trying to figure out what to do, but that's necessary. You gotta go through all the wrong steps to get to the right steps. And in the first year, I, you know, I did fucking neophytes a few times. And I did fucking earth grade a few times because I wasn't positive and shit like that. So, anyways, all this is to say that the symbolism that you do, you're going out shopping, okay? Your mind's wide open, you're walking around, you're shopping, you're consciously shop shopping. But, your subconscious is there. Like, why the fuck does he have a mask on? He's never worn a mask to go shopping before in his life. And he's not shopping as much anymore. He's not going out to the stores anymore. He's complaining about wearing this fucking mask all the time. 
something's changed. It's symbolic. It's telling your body that something's changed. When you go in front of your altar, every altar is maybe it's in your bedroom. Maybe you have your own fucking temple room. You take off all your clothes. You put on that white fucking robe. It's like, whoa, what the fuck's he doing? And then you light the incense and the candle and you start getting in that relaxed state. It's like, Ooh, okay, he's trying to talk to us. We know what's up. Well, you know, you're starting that process off when you go into the store. It's like, I'm not going to the store anymore. That's different. Um, he's putting a mask on. That's different. He's looking at people weirdly and thinking things. That's different. What the fuck is going on here? He's having trouble breathing. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Getting more carbon dioxide levels. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We are fucking sick. COVID's real shit. You know, fucking stupid bullshit. But anyways, be careful when you're doing that crap. I didn't even touch on what I wanted to talk about yet, and I'm already like 40 minutes deep, so I'm going to try to get right to the sigil magic right away, and how this kind of, how this goes with that, how, um, what I was talking about yesterday, the mind, pain or pleasure to put a sigil in, why that's so important, and why it works, and yeah, I'll try to stay on that topic and nothing else, and if not, then you'll get everything I just did, and Nothing you can fucking do about it, but watch it and be like, what the fuck? Well, some of that was useful. The rest of it was just shit, and he never even got what he was going to say. Man, he really does have ADHD. I don't fucking lie to you. I just sometimes don't put out the stuff I'm supposed to All right. So what haven't I said about simple magic that I didn't already say? Well, first of all, let's just go back through everything that I know about simple magic. Grant Morrison was the first time... No, that's not true. But... When I watched Grant Morrison on stage talking about his alien abduction and how magic works and how the chaos magic magicians really inspired him. And I found out he was the guy who wrote The Invisibles and he's knee deep in uh, DC comic shit and a lot of different comic shit lately. Um, and he's the man that, uh, well, he basically, he does a lot of shit basically. So he's deep in the comic shit. And I, you know, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to manifest something bad back then. And he was one of the first things I saw that was like, man, why would this rich fuck go on stage, risk his reputation if, you know, this shit wasn't really real and he didn't really want to change things? Because at that point, the whole alien thing was a possibility in my mind, but I was very leery about it because just like the whole Anunnaki were just slaves fucking digging for gold shit it was one of those things that just man it's not right it doesn't seem accurate it doesn't seem plausible it doesn't seem it seems like bullshit you know so we started talking about his alien abduction you know but you know now i know whatever form you take if you got programming in your mind that aliens are possible and most likely the angels are aliens and higher beings and life forms are just aliens and that's what they are they're different frequency beings then that's the form is going to come to you in just like someone who's a Christian, if they do have a religious experience, well, they're going to see God and Jesus and all that. If someone is an atheist, well, then who knows what they're going to see? Maybe just energy, maybe atoms, maybe fucking source, maybe, you know, who knows? If it's a pagan and witchcraft, well, it might be all earth spirits, fire spirits, water spirits, you know, all elemental earth, pagan, very, you know, variations of it. If it's someone who's in ceremonial magic who uses demons and angels well then you might see them talk to them you know they're gonna get in every shape or form but at that time i didn't really know so i liked what he said about certain things and other things i didn't like but i i whenever someone talks about something whether the information seems real or fake to me regardless of that i always get an overall feeling about the person and the person when grant morrison talks he's not bullshitting you he's not lying to you but there's other people like no offense to this guy or anything, but Corey Good, I think is his name. Um, and I like his stuff. He's funny. I like him. He's fucking funny. I like watching stuff. But when he talks, it's just like, no, it's all bullshit. Um, even David Icke. Now, David Icke, sometimes I get mixed feelings about him. Sometimes he's like, okay, that's right. That's accurate. That's not so accurate. The man himself, more now than ever, than before, but his later stuff and his early, early, earlier stuff to me was his best because that's whenever I get the he's being authentic he's being real but the middle stuff seemed like a lot of just trying to sell out things to get money and not him selling out necessarily he's just repeating the same information maybe that's what it was and then really just changing details and really putting fuck it I don't know I didn't watch a lot of David Icke because I was told when I started Freighter stuff to stay away from the conspiracy doom and gloom stuff so I didn't watch a lot of him 
did in the beginning. But there are certain people, it's just like, okay, that's bullshit, that's bullshit. And that's one of the reasons when I wanted to start creating content, that's what I was gonna do. Because the type of empath, if that's what you wanna call it, which I don't like using that term, but the type of empath that I am is one that can tell people's authenticity, if they're real or fake, okay? And if they're trying to be honest or not, or maybe they're telling you the honest God information that they believe. So, and another one, now I found he had good information because a lot of the information he said, I heard from people that were being authentic, but he wasn't always being authentic, um, but he was off and on. And it was um, fucking Texas redneck that got in trouble for having porn on his screen when he was doing a truth thing. Conspiracy guy, he's on Infowars now. I fucking can't remember his fucking name. Even Freighter Xavier picks on him, fuck. Um, but anyways, that fucking guy, whenever he's on Infowars now, he's always like, I'm like a fucking robot. <laughs> I'm not teasing him, man. He's been through a lot. But he was off and on, authentic, and now he's just, to me, he's like, no. So far from authentic, it's unbelievable. It's all about money right now and fucking, you know, it doesn't matter. He's I And I can't tell the difference for this part. Like, I don't get a reading on this. But either he's trying to get people to believe him so bad that he's going to lie about it, even though he started off trying to be truthful and trying to be honest, or he's always been a fucking shill. He's always been or, or was approached recently to be a fucking shill and a fucking, you know, 